My name is Anselmo Delia. I am the chairman of the Clinton Planning and Zoning Commission. I brought a bottle of water so I don't lose my voice. Um, it is now 7.04 p.m. and I call this public hearing to order. We have a quorum. This hearing is now in session. Would the clerk please read the roll? Anselmo Delia. Here. Alan Kravitz. Michael Rossi. Edward Alberino. Here. Pamela Fritz. Here. Christine Gupil. Here. Michael Knudsen. John Main. Here. James Staunton. Maurice Kirk Carr. Present. Timothy Guerra. Here. Mark Rapuano. Here. Okay, we have some absent members, so I'm going to seat Maurice Kirk Carr for uh, Mike Knudsen, Tim Guerra for James Staunton, Mark Raffiano for Michael Rossi. Uh, would the secretary please read the legal notice of public hearing? The Clinton Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing on Monday, June 2nd, 2014, at 7 p.m. in the Green Room of the Andrews Memorial Town Hall, 54 East Main Street, Clinton, Connecticut, to consider the following. One, SE 14-043, 140 Knollwood Drive, Global Companies, LLC, Wholesale Propane Distribution Facility, Map 22, Block 10, Lot 17, Zone I-1. Item 2. SC 14-073 and sub 292 Sterlingshire Woods, Long Hill Road, 1M Lakey, three lot subdivision including one rear lot, map 75, block 52, lots 5-3 and 6. And item 3, AR 13-145, amendment to the zoning regulation section 31 storage standards. At said hearing, all persons will have the right to be heard and written communications received. The applications and accompanying maps are available for public inspection in the Land Use Office of the Andrews Memorial Town Hall. The text of the proposed amendment is available at the Town Clerk's Office in the Land Use Office of the Andrews Memorial Town Hall. <laughs> Prison Planning and Zoning Commission, and so on the Leah Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Before we get started, I just want to give you the... Uh, parameters of this public hearing so that you all understand how we're going to conduct it. The applicant will make a presentation. After that presentation, any proponent, anyone in favor of the application will be allowed to speak and can ask questions. After all the proponents are done, we're going to let those that are opponents speak and ask questions. After that group of people is done, we will let people that have just general comments, they're neither for nor against, but also wish to speak, we will allow them also to speak. After those items are concluded, the commissioners will have an opportunity to ask questions of the applicant, and after that, the applicant will have an opportunity to speak again and rebut any questions or answer any questions that might have been asked or any issues that might have been raised that have not been addressed prior. We're going to ask you all to conduct yourselves with uh, courtesy and decorum. I will insist on it because otherwise we won't get anything done. I expect all of you with all the smiling faces out there to do just that. And I will promise you an opportunity to speak, address the commission, address the applicant, and needless to say, this hearing will probably, more than likely, be continued. So we will be doing it again at some time in the future. Um, not again, but we will continue it and hear some more evidence. One thing that I ask, because there's so many of you and I anticipate um, much debate and discussion, Please try not to be redundant. If you come up and you're in favor of the applicant or the application, say so, say why. The next person can do the same thing, but if we get into three, four, five saying exactly the same thing, 
we're really not accomplishing what we're here to set out to do. What we're set out to do as a commission is to listen to all the presentations and the evidence as presented and then render eventually a fair and complete decision. So to have people say the same thing over and over again really doesn't get us to that end point. And that goes for any opponents. If you're against the application and you wish to speak, I will allow it. But at some point, I reserve the right to cut it off if everybody says the same thing over and over again. Are we clear? Good. Um, the secretary, uh, is there is there an applicant or agent uh, here? I'm sure there is. That can now make a present. Uh, I, okay. Num the item number two on the agenda, I've just been told, is uh, not going to be opening, so that's off the agenda for tonight. Um, there was something that was not completed, and therefore we're not going to be taking it up, and that just means we give more time to item number one. Okay, applicant or agent? Is it okay to speak from here? Could you it speak is? up? Would, would, you, would you identify yourself and try to project? My name is Diane Whitney, and I am an attorney with Coleman and Comley in Hartford, and I represent the applicant. And I would ask those of you in the back, if, if you can't hear me, raise your hand. I used to be a school teacher. So you, generally, you can hear me, but I will <coughs> try harder. Um, I represent Global Companies LLC tonight in a special exception application for property located at 140 Knollwood Drive in Clinton. Global Companies LLC seeks to establish a wholesale propane distribution facility at that property. The property is in the I-1 zone where this use is permitted as a special exception. This site is a former site of the postage facility of Stanley Black and Decker and has been vacant for a little more than five years at this point. The property consists of 37.3 acres, of which about six will be used for this proposed facility. Global will purchase the entire site, but will not use the buildings, and in fact will be demolishing part of one of the buildings that is in, that is in particularly bad shape. Propane will be delivered to this site by, by rail spur on the property previously used by Stanley, which also had deliveries by rail to this property. The spur will be repurposed for Global's uh, use. Propane will leave the site by truck. In the peak season for propane use, which is the winter, Global expects that there will be 20 trucks a day leaving the facility. The facility will operate five days a week. This is a change from something I said in the application materials where I said six days a week. That is not correct. It will be five days a week from seven in the morning to eight in the evening. That means an average in our peak season of less than two trucks an hour will be leaving the site. The volume of traffic in warmer months will be dramatically reduced, probably to about a quarter of that which is common in, um, in winter months. There are no variances required for this facility. It has been through design review, which took no position. This use is allowed under section 24.276 and 77 of Clinton zoning regulations in the I-1 zone and is regulated under sections 10.50 and 10.51 of the regulations, which govern commercial oil, propane, and gasoline tanks and the storage of hazardous materials. There is no disturbance to the wetlands on this property. There are wetlands on the property, but this operation will not go near the wetlands. Global's plan is consistent with Clinton's plan of conservation and development, which calls for the concentration of new industrial development in previously developed sites, supports alternate modes of transportation, such as rail, and requires no infrastructure. To quote Clinton's plan of conservation and development, 
The industrial zone is intended to permit distribution of goods at an intensity which requires a significant workforce or a significant movement of raw materials, end quote. This zone is also appropriate for uses which require outdoor storage. The commission has received a memo from John Guzgowski, the town planner, the outside consultant who serves as a town planner confirming that this use is permitted and appropriate for this location. He also states in his May 28th memo that the visual impact of the proposed use on neighboring properties, quote, will be negligible, end quote, and that train and truck noise will be buffered by distance, buildings, and significant ve vegetation on the site. He supports our request to be granted a waiver of the requirement that a landscaping plan be presented because we are not altering the landscaping at the property at all, and finds that the truck traffic will not be a significant concern, concern at this site. As you will hear, the remainder of the Bosage property has environmental challenges which would hinder its future development. Given the environmental challenges on the property, Mr. Guskowski is of the opinion that I quote again, a full and vibrant redevelopment of this property is unlikely, close quote. And that application, and that the application should be judged on its merits without speculation as to other possible development plans for the property, which in any event are not <coughs> likely. By saying that this use can be in an I-1 zone, the town has already decided that it's an appropriate use on the property. The question before the Commission tonight is whether the proposed use satisfies the criteria in Sections 9, 10.50, and 10.51. If those criteria are satisfied, <coughs> approval of a special exception should be the result. Clinton has decided that those criteria should be met to protect the public interest. Therefore, a use that meets the conditions and is in harmony with the surrounding property is sufficiently protective of the public and is appropriate for location <coughs> on this property. The facility pr proposed for the property will not be visible from outside the property and will return this unused property into productive use. The site currently generates about $33,000 a year in taxes. We estimate that after development, it will generate at least an additional $100,000 in taxes per year. To tell you the details of the proposal for this site, the following team will speak. Dylan Remley, Deputy General Counsel of Global, will tell you about the company. Jamie Cook, Director of Construction, and Sean Thrasher, Project Manager, will take you to the site plan. Brian Cutler, President of Lavero Engineering and Environmental Consultant for Stanley Black & Decker, will explain the condition of the property how it is being remediated, and how future development will be restricted by the condition of the property. Nick Crescenti, fire protection engineer with SFC Engineering, will explain, explain, explain the safety plan for the property. There are additional members of the global team here if there are questions outside the expertise of those speakers. I have circulated the resumes of all of our speakers is there anyone on the commission who has not received that? Before we go any further, I just want to mention that uh, we need to address the correspondence that's come in. And uh, I don't know if we want to read it all. It's quite extensive. But at least go through the list so that you, council, are aware of it and the public is aware of it. Will the temporary secretary please read it, the list? Okay, this is correspondence list one, received through June 2nd, 2014, concerning SE 14-043, 140 Norwood Drive, Gold Company, LLC. Uh, first item is April 4th, 2014, review letter. The second item is a May 6th, 2014, review letter. May 13th, 2014, an email from Alan Kravitz. An undated flyer from Hammond Asset Environmental Trust. May 28, 2014, a memo from John Gutkowski, CME <coughs> Associates Incorporated. May 29, 2014, a letter from Wade Thomas, Nathan L. Jacobson and Associates Incorporated. 
May 29, 2014, a memo from Diane W. Whitney, Pullman and Calmly LLC, counsel for the applicant. May 29, 2014, letter from Ernest Corsella. June 2, 2014, a memo from Eric Knapp, CEO. And June 2, 2014, an email from Valentina DeCosta and Timothy Ziegler. In addition, <coughs> Okay, this is a document from Stanley Black and Decker, 1000 Stanley Drive in Britain, Connecticut, dated June 2nd, 2014, to the Clinton Planning and Zoning Commission, 54 East Main Street, regarding use application of Global Companies LLC from 140 Norwood Drive. And it was received June 2nd, 2014. Special exception application number 14-043, 140 Norwood Drive. Resumes of speakers received June 2nd, 2014. And a verified petition to intervene in the matter of Global Companies LLC dated June 2nd, 2014 by Hammond Asset Environmental Trust. Thank you. And um, a brief in opposition from the Hammond Asset Environmental Trust as well on June 2nd, 2014 was also received. Thank you. Is that it? Okay, I just wanted to make it known and I don't know how much of that you've had a chance to look at, probably most of it. <coughs> I just asked counsel if she had had an opportunity to review it. These are going to be available to the public at the land use office for further inspection if any of you want to look at them uh, in the future. Some of them came to us tonight, so we haven't seen them either. Therefore, the reason for the continuance of this hearing to a future date, as I said at the outset. Okay, counsel, you may continue with your presentation using the other individuals that were listed. Thank you. Um, Dylan Remley will speak next. Thanks, Sam. <clears throat> My name is Dylan Remley, Deputy General Counsel of Global Partners LP, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, just um, gonna would it be possible for you to stand at the center of the room? The microphone is for recording purposes only, not an Sir, why don't you stand here and project like the rest of us are trying to do? You can address us, but also the, the crowd. Okay. Um, just want to give a few words about the company and the background. Global is a Fortune 150 company engaged in midstream logistics and marketing center around energy products, typically liquid fuels. We own a large network of terminals throughout here in the Northeast. We're a leading distributor of wholesale petroleum products one of the largest independent owners and operators of gas stations and convenience stores in the Northeast. We have a long-standing presence here in the state of Connecticut, including uh, in our 20 primary terminals. We own terminals in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Wethersfield, Connecticut. We also own and operate a number of gas stations here within the state. With respect to propane, we have two propane facilities, one in Albany, New York. It's been running for a little bit more than a year has just under a million gallons of storage, and like this proposed facility, is fed by rail, and then trucks come in and distribute the propane out into the distribution network. We have another one in Westboro, Mass. That's in conjunction with CSX. It's a transloading facility in a rail yard, and the same distribution comes in by rail, out by truck. Lastly, we also have a CNG facility up in Bangor, Maine, a similar type of product, although different. For the many residents and businesses here in the New Haven region, we believe that bringing propane to the area will create <clears throat> increased supply, availability of a cost-effective, clean-burning fuel. We feel that it's <clears throat> consistent with the state of Connecticut, state's initiative to develop different alternatives to heating oil within the state. By developing this facility, we've made a significant investment in the community. It's currently estimated to be an $8 million project to bring this facility to life. We believe it's a uniquely situated property. We have almost 40 acres of industrial <clears throat> unused property. It's zoned properly. It's adjacent to rail. It's got a significant buffer to neighbors to allow the facility to take shape. And it builds out our footprint, provides overlapping customer coverage and service to our facility. 
Propane is currently used by 60 million people in the United States, including more than 12 million households and 1.4 million commercial and industrial establishments. That's from the Propane Education and Research Council. Global is committed to safety. We try to work closely with our employees, customers, and railroads, as well as federal and state agencies and the local communities in which we operate to ensure the safe, reliable handling of energy products throughout our network. Both Fire Marshal Shrimp and Deputy Fire Marshal Hesser have said they have no concerns about the safety of this project. Mr. Remley? Yes. I'm going to go with my comments. I'm going to turn it over. Now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Cook and Mr. Thrasher to walk the commission and the, and the audience to our proposed plan. Well, let me, let me try it without. Uh, my name is Jamie Cook. I work for Global Companies. Uh, I'm responsible for putting together the, uh, the team that's engineering and designing and ultimately will do the uh, uh, installation of, of this facility. I wanted to walk you through the layout of the facility and, and how we're reusing the, uh, the current Stanley Bostic uh, um, property. The entrance is going to come in over here off of Noble Drive. We're going to be a secure facility. It will be a, a card operated gate. The cards are distributed by Global. They go to the employees and they go to the truckers who are actually moving the propane. If you don't have the card, you don't get in. The uh, facility will also be um, covered by closed circuit TV and that gets fed back and gets monitored so that we will have um, perimeter protection of, uh, for people trying to get into the facility if, if they were to try. We talked about what we're doing with the building. In order to, to utilize the footprint on the north side of the building, we're taking down what is right now their loading dock, and there's also a, a, uh, an area that used to be part of their manufacturing facility that extends out probably about 100 feet, is in very poor condition, and that will come down. That's located here in the shaded area, uh, which I'll show you. The shaded area right here. Yeah, I'm sorry. So it's this area right here, and then the loading dock is, is in here. That's, that's, that's to give us access to the trucks into the, into the facility and over the spot. Mr. Cook, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I wanted to note that Mr. James Staunton arrived at 7.12 p.m. He's a regular uh, commissioner. But I don't think I've seated anybody for him. It is Tim, who you can see for Alan. All right, so I can see Tim for Alan. Yes, all right, James, you're seated as a regular member, and I see Tim for Alan Cravens. I'm sorry, go ahead. No problem. So the access is here off of Noble Drive into the facility. The trucks will come in and move in a, in a clockwood, uh, clockwise operation through the facility. When they come in, they come into a scale. They get weighed when they're, they come in, and then we fill them with propane, weigh them when they come out. We're going to put a, a small uh, building in here, which will give our, our plant personnel a place to, uh, to work out of, allow us to put our paperwork together, and also give us uh, sanitary facilities uh, for the site as well. The tanks are located essentially inside with the truck loading up, uh, to the northern side of it. There are rail spurs uh, turn out up here that we are going to repurpose, and we'll bring in two spurs that will allow us to, to offload eight cars at a time. So the cars will come in 16 maximum, and then be offloaded in, into the tanks. The stormwater is all taken care of up here in the uh, north, will be the northwestern corner. Uh, we are staying out of the uh, um, wetlands area, staying outside of the 50-foot buffer as, as well. Um, and this entire facility is fenced off, so there is, there is no access from the outside. The uh, rails will have swing gates, those will, will be locked open when the rail comes in, relocked when the rail uh, leaves. And that is probably the easiest part of the, of the deal. Sean Thrasher is, is our contractor. 
uh, longtime uh, propane uh, facility developer and builder. He's going to walk you through more of the particulars of the equipment, the placement of it, the operation, and, and talk a, a little bit about how this all comes together. You want to leave that up? Yeah, that's fine. Mr. Thrasher, do you want to use the microphone? Um, can everybody hear me? Please. Yes, please. Um, would you like me to explain? Would you like me to explain facing you or facing the crowd? Well, can you orient? I can do my best. I'm going to block somebody, so I apologize. Well, we have, we have this one. That's right. They see. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to see them. I've looked at them, but it would be nice to have you point to certain specific <coughs> items as you go through the presentation. So what I'm going to do is kind of give you a rundown as to the mechanics of the property, the equipment that's going to be going in, as well as how the product will be brought onto the site and removed from the site. Um, as stated before, it's going to be brought in by rail car. Refer up your mouth. We're going to be repurposing the two spurs that are currently on the property for eight spot size, so it'll be 16 cars total. Um, these cars will bring the product onto the facility uh, with this being accessed by a single elevated walkway. So this walkway, So this elevated catwalk will be accessed with stairways on both ends, fire poles, and intermediate uh, in, intermediary uh, sections. The rail cars are top unload, so there are catwalks that will drop to the top with safety cages around them. The piping and manifolds will be connected by flexible hosing. That hosing is connected to uh, uh, welded, welded Schedule 40 and Schedule 80. And if I get a little technical, please just stop me. Well, what are those? It's a thickness of the piping. Per code in NFPA 58, you have to have anything Schedule 40 will be welded. Anything threaded will have to be Schedule 80. So it's a thicker, it's a thicker pipe. Um, these manifolds are connected to compressors. The cars themselves are actually unloaded by uh, pressure differentials by increasing pressure in the cars to push the product out and then recovering that product back to the tanks. So. So the catwalk, it will be connected to uh, through hard, uh, soft pipe hoses to the hard pipes to the compressors. That piping will then go below grade and continue, uh, continue on to the center gap of, of the tanks themselves, where it will uh, uh, be attached to above ground piping manifolds then attached to the tanks. Uh, the product, they're uh, assuming 12, 45,000 gallon tanks. They are 132 inch diameter, 67 feet long. They are uh, they will be set on two sets of pier walls. So they're 11 feet wide? Yes, 11 feet wide. These concrete walls individually have been uh, designed for this property through geotechnical surveys. Um, they will be six feet off the ground to the bottom of the tank. Um, the manifolds will be mounted to these walls and carried horizontally from tank to tank, and that's where the connection is made. For the process of, of loading the trucks, comes out of the tanks to the manifolds, there's one pump per group of six. So there's a single pump servicing each island. There'll be two loading islands that can service two trucks at a time. Um, that piping will then go below ground, continue on to the island. The trucks are a bottom load, so they will then be connected through flexible hosing to the bottom of the truck serviced by each of the individual pumps. Um, as Jamie mentioned, as Jamie mentioned, the trucks will be will be weighed on the process end on their their uh, their route in. They'll come around to each one of the sides of the island, they'll be loaded in the bottom, and then they'll be scaled on the way out. Um, 
scale to determine whether they're the weight. So it's it's me, it's difficult to hear back here. Can you hear me, please? Uh, I'm, I'm doing, I'm the doing my best. I'm trying. I can only face one way. Um, so it will be scaled so they take a, a, a tear weight of what the truck is on its way in and then they fill it with the product and they scale it on the way out. So they go by the, the giving weight of the product to determine how much product has been loaded on the truck. So that's how it's measured. That's the measuring capacity. Um, from that point, they would leave, leave the site. The site, is, uh, the site has a pneumatic operation <coughs> system, which is an emergency shutoff, which actually Mr. Crescenti will talk a little bit about, that each of the transfer points is operated by central. There's a shed right here <coughs> that will have a compressor. This compressor is a pneumatic operation. It will provide the pneumatics uh, to operate all these safety uh, features. Every single opening on the tank has this safety feature, has a pneumatic operator, as well as every connection on soft hoses going to the car, to the rail cars. So that is the, the quick view of the mechanics. Um, I'll actually turn it over to uh, Brian Cutler to talk a little bit about the site itself. Actually, it doesn't go far. Watch out. A couple of things that we have we neglected to tell you. Um, number one is that we still can't hear you. A couple of things that we neglected to tell you, and I'm catching up now, is that the the transportation and the use of propane is heavily regulated by federal and state law. So a lot of the details that you have just heard that maybe don't make a whole lot of sense are because there are federal and state regulations that govern virtually every segment of this business. And so what we're telling you is at least some of the details that confirm that in fact we are meeting all the state and federal regulations for this operation on this property. I also wanted to tell you that um, there is cur currently on the property, and obviously has been for a number of years, a very large propane tank that Stanley clearly used when it was operating the facility. And now I will ask Brian Cutler to speak about environmental conditions on the property. That tank that's there now is nowhere compared to what's intended to be there. Should you eat close? You'll have your chance to speak. Uh, good evening for the record. Can everybody hear me? No. Uh, yeah, it's like that. Turn it on. <laughs> good evening. And for the, can everybody hear me now? Yes. All right, great. Uh, for the record, Brian Cutler. Uh, I'm the president of Larero Engineering Associates. Uh, I am the principal investigator in charge of the characterization and ultimate remediation of the former Bostitch facility. Uh, I've been involved with the facility going back to when it was operational. Um, and uh, in essence, the investigation and remediation of this site is being overseen by the state of Connecticut through the Department of Energy and Environmental, Profes uh, Energy and Environmental Protection. I, as a licensed environmental professional, am allowed to oversee that, in essence, on behalf of the state of Connecticut. Ultimately, though, the state of Connecticut will have to concur that the site has been remediated in a manner consistent with the standards that exist in the state today. As we stand here today, the investigation, so that's the characterization of soil and groundwater releases on the property, has been complete. A remedial action plan has been submitted to the state of Connecticut, and remediation activities have been undertaken on the property. And those remediation activities include the closure of former solid waste disposal facilities that were permitted by the state of Connecticut, the closure of former lagoons, infiltration lagoons, because there's no sanitary sewers in the state of Connecticut or in the in the town of Clinton. So those were for the infiltration of pre-treated industrial wastewater. Those have been closed. The remaining activities to be completed on the site are those associated with the remediation of groundwater. And the groundwater remediation will continue for the foreseeable future. As part of the remediation, the site, <coughs> there will be restrictions that will be applied to the site, and these are again consistent with the programs in the state of Connecticut. There will be a large overarching restriction which will apply to every acre of the property, and that will prohibit the use of the property for anything other than commercial or industrial use. So that means no residential use on the property going forward. In addition to that, there will also be use restrictions associated with the portion of the property, again, largely not associated with Global's operations, but more what I'll call in the southern portion of the site. And those are the former uh, uh, solid waste disposal facilities that have been closed. 
So those are capped. Uh, there will be a use restriction that will preclude the disturbance of those caps or basically the future use of those areas of the site. And in addition to that, there will also be a restriction placed on the footprint of the building, which will preclude the disturbance of any soils underneath the footprint of the building, again, without permission of the state of Connecticut. So that's a very high-level summary of the investigation or mediation status of the site, and I will be around later if necessary to answer any questions. Everybody else can see what he's talking about. Could you put the charts up against the wall? That's fine. Why don't we take a moment to make the switch? I want everybody to be satisfied, and particularly I want the commissioners to understand what's going on. Put the charts up against sir, the wall. You'll be able to see sir, it. Sir, I, I, I understood yeah. exactly what you meant. It's a good suggestion. We're going to incorporate it into our proceedings. How's that? engineering and I'm a fire protection engineer that's what I've done for a long time more than most of my people would like me to count. Part of my job here is to look at the right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Away from the screen. Is this better now? Yes. yes. So my picture's gonna fall down. You gotta hold it right up here. Okay, my job is to talk a little bit about propane safety, how we got where we are, what the rules are, what can happen, what's not going to happen, and how this facility is made safe. You have to look at the rules that are in place now for LP gas or propane. And the rules are put together by a group, National Fire Protection Association, and adopted by local, state, and actually federal authorities. Each standard that the NFPA produces 
is put together by a committee of people. And the people on the committee represent all the constituencies. So there's users, there's enforcers, there's experts, and it's a balanced committee. That means that one, no, one group does not have enough votes to sway the committee. So when the people that put together the propane standard, which is called NFPA 58, when they decide they meet in a group, they put forth the regulations, they vote on the regulations, and through a process, the entire NFPA committee or the entire NFPA body has an opportunity to vote. In addition, um, almost anybody can make public comments on the rules that are being put forth by the NFPA. Um, as a little aside, I was on a committee once where we got 6,000 public comments. So obviously we stirred the pot a little. Propane, the, the standard that we use in Connecticut is the 1995 version of NFPA 58. That's the requirement by law that we have to meet. Since the 1995 version was put out, there have been several iterations and improvements to the codes and standard that govern propane. One of the things that I'll get into later is a fire safety analysis that has to be performed that was added after that. The other things that have been added are primarily safety devices. Of all the, the uh, things that the NFPA regulates, and there's a lot of them, the stack of codes and standards about four feet tall, propane is the one material that they just simply said, we are not going to have a fire. We're going to design these facilities so they do not have problems. The reason they did that was because of the um, problems that occurred in the 60s, 70s, and before that, where they had large explosions, railroad car failures, truck failures, tank failures, and the NFPA committee set about making sure that the designs of today do not incorporate those problems. They set to work, they did the science to see why these things occurred, what can be done to prevent them, and then incorporated them into the standards. The new standards, or newer standards, require that every single propane tank that's this size has an internal valve that is normally closed. That means is you have to physically find a way to hold it open. The way it's held open, and you heard Sean Thrasher mention it a while ago, is with pneumatic pressure. Throughout the facility, there is, let's call it a piece of plastic pipe. And that pipe has pressure in it that's generated from a compressor in the little building that we're going to put on the site. That pressure holds open, in fact, all of the valves on the facility are held out by that. The reason that that little piece of conduit is plastic is so that if something happens, it melts. It melts, pressure is released, Every valve in the place closes. Simple as that. Every single tank closes down, every single railroad car closes down, all the trucks close down, everything, done. Nothing moves. Pretty good system. On top of that, put a redundant. And we have emergency stop buttons throughout the facility. Somebody hits the button, everything stops. Compressor shut down, pump shut down, Valves all close, everything's done. No gas movement. You have to physically go back and start all over again to get things moving. Gives you an opportunity to find a problem and resolve the problem. So, the, the internal valve on the tank provides the opportunity to limit the flow of gas out of the tank. Once you close that valve, no more gas comes out of that tank. It's done. 
So that means that if there's any kind of fire, truck fire, whatever else on that site, small fire, is limited to the largest distance between two valves in the piping, because it's not coming out of the tank anymore. So typically in a tank like this, the longest single stretch of pipe is 40 feet of a two inch diameter pipe. It's not very much gas. In order to get that to burn, you have to mix it to the perfect mixture to, to burn. So it's extremely difficult to have any kind of large fire with this. We also are providing on this site um, monitors and um, like little detectors that will be able to see the fire, the fire eye detectors, so that any fire they can see, that will also shut down the operation. So there's the automatic shutdown, there's the manual shutdown, and there's the detection shutdown. Also on this site, we're going to supply two water monitors that are fed off the existing hydrant system. We will um, pick up a, a hydrant down here in this corner, extend the water pipe around. We're not going to use the old pipe because we're not real sure how good that is. We're going to extend it out and we'll have two monitor nozzles to be able to wet things down, keep things wet in case something happens. So there's a lot of things that we're looking at. In, in addition, we're 140 feet from the nearest property line for the size tanks that we're using. We only need to be 75 feet. We have five and a half feet between the tanks. By code, by Connecticut law, we only need five. We have a 10 foot radius around all the points of transfer that is set up to be electrically explosion proof. I'm not sure how deep you want me to dive into that, but what it means is that any electrical connections are set up specifically so they don't spark or create any kind of problem. So the standard, the people that have built, put together the standards that we use to put together these operations and these plants have spent a lot of time figuring out where the problems occur and how to prevent them. We've picked up on that, we've moved forward. In this particular site, we have, some, we have a lot of extra distance from the property line, which by the way is a railroad. We haven't even got to the other side of the railroad yet. We have a 140 foot setback to the tank. We have the 75 foot, you can see the radius here, the 75 foot around the tank. We have a bank of six and then a 25 foot gap and another bank of six tanks. So not, not even all 12 tanks are right side together. There's a, there's a space, that's also code required. We have the entire building in between us and whatever happens on this side of the river. So we've done a lot of work. We've worked with all the codes. We've put forward this plan there are some points that we need to talk about. Um, one is that some people like to see containment around tanks. <clears throat> containment only prevents airflow. And airflow when you have a gas is your enemy. You want, you want it moved. In addition, um, having containment for a product that is liquid in the tank but in, at normal air temperatures, it's a gas accumulating in a accumulating liquid in the pockets of a containment is a bad idea. That again, you want it open, and then finally, the reason that you want it open and you want people to be able to see it is if something happens or somebody wants to see it, the last thing you want to do is try to climb up and peek over a fence. If at night, for whatever reason, the, the police officer is making his rounds. You want him to be able to look in there so that he can see what's going on. If somebody snuck over the fence somehow, you want them to be able to look. Even if the TV picked them up, and remember that we're going to have closed circuit TV here. The TV picked them up. They're going to call the police. The police are going to come here and look at it. You want them to be able to see in there. You don't want anything hidden when you're dealing with the gas. You want it open, you want it wide open, you want it so the air will move. Not to say that we're not going to have a nice big fence around this thing, but the fence is not going to be, or should not be, solid. We want the wind to blow through here. 
The idea is if you have a little leak, it quickly mixes with enough air so that it's no longer volatile. And by little leak, leak remember I talked about we're only going to have a leak as long as the longest length of pipe. That's the leak that we have. Um, even today, the hoses that hook to the trucks are smart hoses, which means that if, uh, if the truck driver decides to leave with the hose still hooked up, which happens, when the hose breaks, the flow shuts off. So the safety is built in. So that, so that even the truck leaving, the other reason for that, quite frankly, is that every time you break the connection, you hear a little pssst of gas, while every little pssst is about a nickel. So you want to make sure that you save that money. So basically, this is one of the, one of the sites that we've worked on where we actually have more room than we need to be able to put this safely to meet all the rules, all the Connecticut rules, NFPA standards, this is one of the best sites that we've worked on for that. It's isolated, it's set off from everything else, there's not a lot of traffic surrounding the site, we have plenty of space, works out good. Okay, that's me. Okay, I'll hold that while the next speaker comes up. Thank you. Is there a next speaker? Attorney Whitney, Attorney Whitney, do you have, do you have any more comments? I just have a couple, a couple of things. Um, one is that there are a lot of different standards that apply to this site. Um, you've heard Mr. Cassenti say something about 75 feet from the property line. Um, that's an NFPA requirement. Clinton has a stricter requirement, which is 100 feet, and we satisfy that also. So there are, there are a lot of different standards. And in, in your sections 1050 and 1051, there are a whole host of standards. Um, we've already submitted information to all of you showing that we, we meet those standards, and the fire marshal has agreed. Um, so we were, we were not planning to go through the whole list tonight, but if, certainly if you have questions about them, we would be happy to go through any of them that, uh, that you need to ask about. I suspect there will be questions from the audience, perhaps, and then we can address it at that point. The commissioners will have questions once the commission receives the uh, report from the engineer, the third-party engineer that we've engaged, that you are aware of. Right. And we don't have it yet. So at that point, I think it would be more timely to ask you those specific questions. Right. Are you concluded with your um, application remarks? Yes. Okay. It is time now for the audience to uh, participate, ask questions, uh, direct them to the applicant. Uh, for the time, for this time, we're going to have anybody that's in favor of the application come up and speak. Uh, so I would ask you to please identify yourselves, and we have a sheet at the end of the table over there where you can write your name, and uh, we can have a, a record for the minutes that are going to have to be. Uh, prepared after this recording is concluded at the end of tonight. So please, any proponent, anybody in favor, come up. I'll give you the microphone. You can ask your questions. Anybody in favor of this application wishes to speak? Anybody in favor of the application wishing to speak? You do. Okay. Yeah, why don't you identify yourself? My name is Ona Nadel. My name is Ona Nadel. I've been a resident of Clinton for over 50 years. I was very uncertain about this application, even though I'm involved in town events um, on the Board of Finance and other committees. But um, I know that the town has hired an independent uh, planner who has embraced this. Um, and also our fire department has embraced this. And I trust that within the realm of those two bodies, since this is an industrial site, it's always had a railroad spur, 
It's, they used to bring heavy, heavy rolls of metal there to make staples for years and years. I think it's a good use. I think it's, it's part of what should be our town development um, in terms of having some tax base that's industrial. And I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor of this application? Same rule. So Got it. You I already took care of step one. Very good. My name is Gerard Campion, 116 Old Nod Road, uh, Clinton. Uh, I initially was very concerned with the idea of uh, liquid natural gas and propane in Clinton until I went and did some research uh, to find there was an accident in 1941 in Cleveland that killed a number of people. There was an accident in 1979 in, uh, was uh, in Maryland that created a new level of standards. Uh, there was an accident in 2004 due to a steam boiler uh, blowing up. There was an accident in Massachusetts, I believe, in 2014. They don't have the rationale for that accident. There are uh, liquid storage units in New York City and Boston that have been there since 1960 without any uh, uh, issues. So I think we should very so strongly consider putting in the tanks. There are two issues that I would bring up that are concerns of mine. One is traffic. And you sit in the house in Clinton, you can hear traffic depending on the wind off the highway. I think we should consider limiting the hours that trucks can be moving in and out uh, 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 of the facility. And that would be the major concern that I would have. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else wishing to speak in uh, favor of this application? I'm going to do it two more times to give everybody a chance to get over the shyness. Anybody wishing to speak in favor of this application? Anyone else wishing to speak in favor of this application? Hearing none, I will now open it up to those that wish to speak in opposition of the application. And this gentleman over here, sir, will you identify yourself? I know who you are, but... Sir, will you sign in, please? If anyone wants to sign in in advance so we can take it in order and save some time, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Fillmore McPherson. I am the first selectman in the neighboring town of Madison. And I appreciate what you all are doing for your industrial development. And uh, I realize that every town has to do uh, some of that, uh, take care of some of those activities. My concern, though, has to do uh, with the safety because uh, this uh, project is only a few hundred yards away from Madison and a very large um, housing area, the Windermere uh, complex, uh, that is right across the river and I think uh, could be in jeopardy should something go wrong. I, I listened to the gentleman's uh, statements about safety and so on. Uh, one particular concern I have, though, has to do with, with fire and fire suppression. It's my understanding that the code requires, uh, and this is from the state, I'm getting this from our fire marshal, that the state code requires uh, a 500 gallon uh, per minute a capacity of cooling spray to go on each tank should uh, some untoward event happen. Uh, uh, the, the six uh, tanks that are all together in one bank would be uh, would require then 3,000 gallons a minute. If you look at all 12 uh, tanks together, now you're talking 6,000 gallons a minute. Uh, I'm told that the fire main in that area is only capable of 2,000 gallons per minute. So I would, uh, now it could be that uh, we have misread the, the state requirements, but this is the latest word I have from our fire marshal, and I would ask that before you all move forward that this uh, question, at least at least this question be clarified to ensure that we have adequate uh, fire safety and uh, hence explosion safety um, activities in place. Thank you. Thank you. against this application, come forward. Uh, 
my name is uh, Robert Ruggiero. I uh, live in Clayton. I've been a resident here for uh, over 40 years. Um, I would just like to uh, express my concerns. Uh, Mr. Fillmore, I guess, uh, I, I think that's his name from Madison, uh, was one of the questions I had brought up um, during this, uh, this, uh, this session. Uh, one is the, uh, the traffic. Um, that bothers me the most uh, because we have a wonderful park uh, at Hammond Acid. Um, my understanding is that if these trucks are going to be leaving <clears throat> every two hours, there's no other place they can go down uh, through Clinton. It would have to go through the Hammond Acid connector. Yes. And that would... Yes. Now that... I'm going to ask you to refrain from applause and commentary while the speaker is speaking. Um, that's not the uh, order of business here. He will finish his comments and you will also have an opportunity to speak. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. So, uh, especially during the summer, uh, the traffic is, uh, is horrendous. Uh, we have a wonderful park. Uh, we got Route 1, uh, and with trucks coming every two hours, uh, that doesn't that doesn't buy anything for the uh, the uh, the public. It's more congestion. We have some beautiful places that uh, people eat and enjoy uh, along the uh, along the shoreline. Um, I'm not really sure how the uh, the propane is coming in by rail, uh, but um, there is some safety things I I like to address too. Uh, one of the persons that was up here talked about the federal and state regulations, but he was only talking about the properties. What about the roads? Can these trucks, can these trucks uh, take care of the roads that they're going to destroy? These trucks are very, very big. They're very heavy. Uh, there's an awful lot of repairs that have to be made to these roads if, this, if there's trucks going up and down Route 1. So that's another thing that I'm very, very concerned about. So I, uh, I like to, you know, have somebody address the. Uh, the federal and state uh, laws in regard to the the roads, not the properties. Okay, uh, and the second thing is uh, <clears throat> the uh, the gentleman that came up here to make the presentation about the property uh, talked about the safety. Um, I took a course in um, in propane, and one of the uh, agents that they add into the propane. Because the uh, propane itself cannot be detected unless they put this this material in there to uh, to detect or to smell that propane is as a leak. But are they doing something safety enough so that aside from the fire or an explosion, that if there's a gas leak, is there a detection for picking up the smell of this gas and then shutting the whole system down before there is an explosion? He talks only that if there's a fire, if it melts a hose, and that everything is shut down. But before that, that's another concern. Uh, the bridges. There's a bridge that's from Madison to Clinton. Can the trucks support those trucks coming across that bridge? I'd like to have somebody look into that also. Um, let's see. I don't, I don't really know how trucks are going to be coming out of this facility. They talked about, again, the facility, but when I looked at that road, some of these trucks, I don't know how big they are or how long or how heavy it is, but is the company going to be doing something about the inlet and the outlet of these roads uh, along, the, uh, along the property? So uh, those are the things that uh, just come to my attention, but to me, uh, the safety of the public is more important right now uh, along the shoreline with the congestion uh, along the shoreline. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You signed in, sir? I already did. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Merle Wade. I live on Two Martin Drive. I've lived in this town for 49 years. I have a pond right across from Two Martin Drive, and they claim <coughs> it's polluted with acid from Bostitch. 
Years back, when Bostitch, they had quite a few pits over there. They would bring the wire in by rail. The wire would be taken off the cars, they'd be put out, and, but they'd have to put them in these pits with acid to clean off the, the wire so they could make their staples and stuff. After a while, these pits filled up with sludge from the rust. It was taken out, and it was dumped out in the back. They dug a big hole, several holes, several years this was going on. I only live about a half a mile from Bostitch. When I first moved over there and to Martin Drive, I still can see the railroad tracks. The trees grew up, and I can't see Bostitch, but I can hear when the trains go through. Now I know for a fact, when Bostick used to go and get the uh, train cars come in with the wire, at night, sometimes 7.30, sometimes 8 o'clock, whenever the trains got through, sometimes it was even 10, 11 o'clock at night, they would come in, and when they would go and disconnect the pool cars, there would be empty ones there. They'd have to go and wrap those two jaws to make darn sure those cars were clicked. And when they took off, click, 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 off they went down the track. I can hear it, two, three o'clock in the morning, now they're out there working on a train. This is going to be a mess. Now, no one's even mentioned about this. When the insurance company, if this does go in, the insurance company of everybody close by, your insurance is either going up or it's a possibility your insurance could be dropped. Then where are you gonna go? Willie Fritz wants this in the worst way, and no matter what, it's going. Of course the fire marshal is saying it's okay. The assistant fire uh, chief is saying it's okay. If they don't say, they won't have a job. Thank you. I can assure you, sir, that this commission has not made up its mind in any way, shape, or form. So rest assured that whatever you think about us here sitting down, that's not the case. Well, where is he? Uh, where is where where an that? He should be right here, too. Sir, I'm, I'm not here to debate okay. who's here and who's not. I voiced my opinion. That's right. And I've been in that's the town right. for 49 and years, and I can see the stuff that's going that's, on. That's the beauty of our system. We all get to voice our opinions, and that's fine. But we want to do it in an orderly way in a way that is courteous to others and without making accusations that may not be true. So with that, I can assure you that this commission has an open mind, okay? Uh, I know I do, and I'm uh, the chair. So, next person. My name is Thomas Jordan, I'm a resident of Windermere. And a few of the things that's already mentioned by one of the gentlemen prior to me is what I had about the weight of these trucks coming out. There's no viaduct that they can up wonder in this area. They've got to come through Madison over the bridge. The weight of the trucks and the bridge got to be in contention. They'll use Route 1 and take the Hamanassa connectors, we all know. I heard no mention by any of the proponents of this thing about having a backup generator in case power is lost, which happens quite frequently. There's no, they didn't address that at all. Now we all remember the issue about the big natural gas ship that was intended to be anchored on the New York City State Line outside New Haven. That finally Richard Blumenthal got rid of that. Now this is just another thing that we have to contend with and I think we have to fight to keep it out of here, my own personal opinion. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Michelle Sawatsky, and I live at 10 Molewood Drive. And I would just like to thank whoever, I don't know if they're in this room, um, but not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before that, I received a letter regarding this whole project um, in my mailbox. It wasn't mailed, it was just put in my mailbox. And I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have known about it if I didn't get that letter. Um, I don't, you know, I. I wouldn't have known, and um, so that disturbs me. Um, that I live on that road, 
Um, I personally have been on that road for 10 years and I own a house and my husband um, uh, lived in that house for 37 years. And uh, my youngest daughter's eight years old and uh, you know she's, she's scared. She doesn't want the trucks. Um, she says, Mommy, how am I gonna play outside if all these trucks are going up and down the road? I just, I, I, I'm, you know, nervous, um, and, uh, so, I really, I, I've never done this before, I've never been to a meeting, but I had to come because I live on that road, and not one person from this town came to my house, knocked on our door, sent us a no letter, something, that, that, this, that this was happening. So, this past weekend, my daughter and I, we took a walk with her little scooter, down to the end of the road and saw the application on the fence. How would I have saw? I never would have saw that. Never. And so I'd like to thank the person who, you know, sent us that letter. And you know, um, I'm just nervous. I'm nervous about the trucks. I know that you know you said it was going to be the winter time, but it's still wearing down on our street. Uh, we live there. There's houses there with people. So I mean, out of I, I don't know if you guys forgot that, but there's kids on that street. I can't even get a sign that said kids at play. I asked years and years ago and said it was just too much, too much red tape. It would just take too much time to get a, to get a sign that said kids at play. So, I mean, are they going to put a sign up, a big, huge sign? I know, I'm just, I'm really nervous. I just don't think it should be there. I don't think that, I understand that we need the revenue. I pay taxes. I'm, I understand that we need the money. I understand that Unilever's closed down, but I don't think we're that desperate that we need to fill it with something this dangerous. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Nancy Lita, and about six months ago, I retired to the town of Clinton and my house is on Noel Drive. I wanted to know if someone from Global wants to buy it. <laughs> also, I understand the um, lawyer lady when she said there's lots of vegetation out there because it, it is, and I think y'all did your homework, and it seems like it would be, it meets all the dots and whatever for every regulation, but we live there. So to me, it's like, <coughs> Grandkids, big trucks. I'd like to thank you all for coming and Good evening, everybody. My name is Nick Morrow, and I live at uh, 24 Aylesbury Circle in Madison, which is right across the river from this proposed uh, proposed uh, project. And I'm here tonight to let you know that I'm very uncomfortable living across the river from a possible explosion effect. Yeah, I feel it. Okay, can you hear me better now? Thanks. I'm getting cues from the back of the room here. I, I feel very uncomfortable living across the river from there, and I'm, I'm here to express my opposition tonight of this project. And I, I actually urge the, the council to vote to reject it based on, on some of the things I heard tonight. And I understand that, you know, that all the safety regulations are being heard and there, you know, and all the dying the eyes and crossing the T's and all that stuff, but we live there, guys. We live there. If something goes wrong, we're gonna be in the blast area and we're gonna be gone. So thank you for listening to me and I, I appreciate it. My name is Nada Young. I live in Madison in Windermere. I'm about 500 feet from where the tanks are proposed to be installed. Um, I have no complaint. There is no complaint under the city's master plan that the subject, 37 acres, are zoned industrial. Though knowing what we know now, perhaps small houses like those in Windermere would have been wiser several years ago. Years ago, the city approved a manufacturing facility on the site. While a good-sized building was only two stories high, 
It had plenty of parking and, and it employed many people. In short, the building was proportional to the site and surrounding properties. The city would not have allowed a 10-story, 20-story, or 30-story manufacturing facility that would have been too big for the site, not fit in with the surrounding property. Nor could the Clinton Fire Department have fought a fire in the building of such great size. Unfortunately, even the building that was approved turned out to be a big mistake. We all know that now. It was noisier than, it, than anticipated. It, was, it went out of business. And it left an environmentally contaminated site. But at least it wasn't 10 stories high. This is the issue with this current application. Perhaps one 45,000 gallon tank might fit in, about the size under consideration in Guilford right now. A problem with one that size would be serious, but the fire department could deal with that fire and its impact would likely only be on the site and not, not affect adjoining properties. But 12 tanks, 12 tanks, 540,000 gallons. It's like a 10 story building, too large for the site not proportional to surrounding properties and subject to a catastrophe that the Clinton Fire Department could not possibly handle. The city's approval of the last manufacturing facility on this acreage resulted in losing the property for future use because of chemical contamination. Yet that request seemed reasonable perhaps at the time. This proposed 540,000 gallon propane storage facility does not. Do not make an even bigger mistake now by permitting this enormous facility where any serious problem will impact all surrounding properties with no realistic possibility the town can do anything other than let whatever explosion occur as it may without hope of rescue from its burning. In short, one more just quick paragraph. In short, just because it is an industrial use property does not make this plan acceptable. You would not allow an oversized building then. Do not allow an oversized storage plant now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Fred Petzer. I also live in Windermere. My address is 27 Aylesbury Circle in Madison. I have strong concern about the facility as well, and I think about it in terms of risk and reward. We earlier heard the site described as isolated. Uh, I don't think the people who live on Nola Drive, Highland Drive, Knob Road, and people who spend time on the very busy section of Route 1 nearby would think of it as very isolated. I have aerial photos here, which I'll enter into the record uh, to show the proximity of these, of these other addresses to the facility. The impact of a blevy, a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion involving the volume of pro propane proposed at this site is impossible for someone like me to imagine, really. It does not seem reasonable to place a risk like that in an area as populated as this. As for the potential benefits, we heard a testimony earlier by the uh, applicant regarding estimated property tax collection increases. There, there was no mention in the application of any acceleration of the remediation of the already existing pollution on the site. And there was only, the, the, in, the, the, in the application itself submitted by Global, it implied only minimal added job creation for the site. When you take into account the potential risk of a major explosion and the impact that that would have on, on, the, on the surrounding area and compare it to the benefits such as they are, it just doesn't seem reasonable to me. I, I don't see why we should take the risk. Thank you. My name is John Allen. I'm a Clinton resident for about eight or nine years. And just briefly, I don't know what the upside is. Um, do the math, and it's $300 a day. It's $100,000 a year net increase in taxes. It's 300 a day for 20 trucks going back and forth for 12 tanks, 16 rail cars sitting here all the time, 
the damage to the our real estate values, to our to, to our neighbors, to everybody else. I mean, there's a reason that these things are so highly regulated because they're very highly dangerous. The reason all these you know all these regulations are in effect is because close to nuclear power, it's about as bad as it gets. So I don't know what, you know what you think, but I think we deserve a lot better in this town than have to settle for a propane dump. Well, you know, I don't know what the answers are, but that's just my point of view. Good evening. My name is Marion Kirby, and I live at Windermere, and my address is 4 Aylesbury Circle in Madison. I'm here tonight because I'm uncomfortable and fearful about the propane installation under Windermere tonight. This is why accidents happen. Just a quick search on the history of incidents at large propane installations reveals information that justifies the fear, not just for Windermere residents, but for Clinton residents and for Connecticut residents who regularly visit this beautiful area summer and winter. I'd like to tell you about a few things I found. September of 1983, railroad cars delivering propane in Murdoch, Illinois derailed Fire ensued and 30,000 gallons of propane caused an enorma, enormous blevin, which is a word we've used tonight. I just became educated as to its meaning, a boiling liquid that expands to a vapor explosion, creating a huge foam of fire. People within 1,000 feet suffered burns. My community is only 550 feet away from the proposed facility. A tanker car threw feet flew 3,600 feet from the rail line. Both Windermere and residents of Clinton are within 3,600 feet from the rail public service the facility. One expert concluded that Murdoch, or included Murdoch, as one of the 25 deadliest explosions man ever created. The shock to the property was felt six miles away. Tonight, we are only one mile away from the site where the railroad will unload propane and accidents happen. In October of 2007, a foundry exploded in Tacoma, Washington, which captured on tape by company cameras. You can see it on YouTube. Thunderous concussion resulted from the explosion and cars were nearly thrown by, off a nearby overpass. It was due to mechanical failure and accidents happened. In 2008, deadly explosions occurred in California, Colorado, Maine, Michigan, New Hampshire, New Mexico, Oregon, Vermont, Wyoming, and Utah, caused by snow and ice damage to piping and equipment. And we all know what our last two winters were like. In August of 2008, there was a propane incident and an industrial propane installation in Toronto, calendar, Canada, causing a five-alarm fire. The blast caused evacuation of the surrounding area and cost $1.8 million to clean up. Large pieces of metal ejected into nearby streets and properties. Homes and businesses were damaged. The blast shattered windows and ripped doors off their hinges. Evacuation became necessary within a 100-mile radius. 100 homes were left uninhabitable. It took 200 firefighters to contain the fires. Was it caused by misuse, an accident? A misuse, an accident, strangers in our world? As recently as July, as July of 2012, 30,000 pound, pounds of propane exploded in Tavers, Florida, near Orlando. It melted vehicles. The conclusion was it was caused by a mistake. Accidents happen. I beg you to consider the danger this installation potentially poses not only to my community, but to yours. This is a highly populated area, <coughs> and global doesn't belong right here. <laughs> My name is Mary.
Mary Berlin. I live at 20 Ellsbury in Windermere also. My house is within 600 feet of what would be the blast zone. I wouldn't even know what hit me. So, I wouldn't even know what hit me. Um, if there was a blast or no warning, and I wouldn't even know. I was going to speak about the traffic, but <laughs> I was warned, don't repeat yourself. So um, I do, my, one of the things I wanted to talk about was perhaps the turning radius of these trucks and the, that are coming down. Or if they come down the Hamanasa connector, they hit Route 1, they have to make the left turn. And you guys all know what what's, you know, Route 1 is like there. It's a lovely little section. And there's a nice park there that's just going to be open soon in Madison. It protects uh, one of the few remaining estuaries uh, that are undeveloped. And then what about the turn into Knollwood Drive? That's pretty sharp, you know, going in and out. It doesn't look too safe to me. So I'm very concerned about the traffic and was shocked to hear that there would be eight railroad cars, 16 railroad cars lined up at the facility. The blast of one of those railroad cars would do me in, we'd be done. So I just can't believe that anyone would consider really a facility like this in a residential area with so many people affected. Thank you. My name is Jamie Weiss. I live at 3 East Shore Drive in Clint. What's very disappointing <coughs> is that the town of Clint was never notified properly, I feel. The application should have been posted right at the end of Knollwood so that everybody would know. You know how I found out? Facebook. Facebook. Okay. I'm very upset because I can't believe the amount of congestion that's going to be there from 20 hazmat trucks. I have a CDL license. I'm a bus driver. I got to go through there every day. There are kids that get on and off the bus in that area. There are kids that go to the bounce place. My daughter will not be going into that area anymore. Why? I don't feel that it's safe because the road isn't wide enough to handle the amount of traffic that's going through there. And when you do the turn radius, yes, you're going to have tailswing. You're going to have people trying to go around the big, the big uh, truck so that they can't stay and wait. Is it worth it? I don't think so. We have to think about Clinton. We have to think about the Clinton people. I'm a survivor of Unilever chemical dump on East Shore Drive. Contaminated water because this town 20 years ago allowed them to dump toxins up there. I saw my little puppy's leg get chemical burns. I don't need to see my neighbors burn to death because of an accident. Think long and hard when you make this deliberation, please. Thank you for your time. Uh, before we go on to the next speaker, I want to address the concern about proper notice. Um, I think you have to realize that the procedure allows for legal notice to be put in the newspaper as it was, and you heard the legal notice read at the outset of this meeting, this hearing. Um, to have a, an agency such as this of the town promote in greater manner than the legal notice, in essence, would create the appearance of having prejudged an application. If we go out and promote for people to come out and oppose it legally, that's not something you want to have. So there are enough people out here against it, so I guess the word got out. The legal notice was done in accordance with statutes, and that's all I can say about it. There is no effort to promote any application because we do not, as, as a commission, wish to uh, create the the impression that we're in favor or against something. We need, we're sitting here, this is a little bit of education, but I think it's important. We're sitting here in many ways like a court of law. We're hearing evidence, and based upon what we hear and what you have to say and what our experts have to say, we will render a fair and unbiased decision. And I will make sure that happens. And I don't know how it's going to go, but we're going to hear some more. So, next question. My name is Henry Arnold, 
my wife and I own uh, the condo in Windermere that probably is the closest one to the facility, uh, 14 Canborn Way. Uh, I know you're curious about how somebody who talks this way could be interested in this. Uh, <laughs> In, in uh, 1999, one year before I retired, uh, we bought the property here and uh, have been living in uh, uh, Camborne Way. I, uh, I lived, I was, grew up in North Alabama, lived most of my life in a small county in uh, Tennessee, Franklin County, Tennessee. Uh, I have I, I guess I, I have, uh, need to identify two biases. Uh, one, I, I know from, from my wife's being so upset about this that there's probably nothing that anybody could say that would persuade her that it's going to be safe to live here if, if the facility is built and that it, we'll be able to sell the place for anything if the facility is built. So she's worried. That, She's worried about both of those. Uh, I'm uncertain about whether she's right, but I know I can't persuade her. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also bring a lot of skepticism to this sort of proceeding. For 31 years, I was a county commissioner in our county in Tennessee, and my bias was always sympathy with the surrounding property owners when the high-priced out-of-town experts came in and painted the rosy picture about how great it was going to be for the uh, county to uh, let this uh, industry uh, facility, uh, half of which turned out to be lemons, uh, was going to uh, was going to be how, how everybody was going to be for the county. Uh, in, uh, you know, I, I have no expertise in so much of this that, that uh, we've heard talked about tonight. Uh, I, I guess I would have one, I, I just would share, like to share with the commissioners uh, the kind of question I would be asking uh, of the company before I felt at all secure in casting my vote on this issue. I, for 31 years, I, I had two or three of these come up every year that I had to make a decision about. Uh, in this particular case, I mean, if I were you, I would want to know how much liability insurance these people were going to take out on this facility and what the premiums were and whether the company that was going to insure it was one you could trust. I would hope you would look into that. And you'd probably get the answer, well, we don't know because we haven't done this yet. Well, I would say, okay, uh, Global, open your books and let us see how much liability insurance you have in Albany and how much the premium is for that. And let us see how much liability insurance you have in Massachusetts and let us and, tell, and let us see what the premiums are for that. And we'll get some non-company hired insight into what somebody's in the business of trying to figure out the risk involved here thinks we're up against. I would appreciate that. Hi, my name is uh, Alan Parcells. I'm also a resident of Windermere Condominiums. I had three simple questions. I won't talk about traffic anymore or anything like that. Uh, the one question I have is, we live in Madison. If I smell gas, do I call the Clinton Fire Department or do I call the Madison Fire Department? Who responds? Uh, and will there be monitors on our property since we're in close proximity to that site that would uh, sense any, any gas in the area? Uh, the other thing, I did some uh, research on their Albany facility, and this would be something I'd have to ask the P&Z. Uh, they expanded their site from 540,000 gallons to a million gallons. Is there proposal, I mean, is there expansion plans that can be introduced into this site if it's approved? Or is that, I don't know. 
So can it be expanded at a later date? Um, the other, you know, the other big concern I have is about our property insurance. Yeah, we live in a high risk area because of storms and hurricanes, and we have great difficulty in getting insurance. Our insurance premium went from eighteen thousand dollars to forty-five thousand dollars because of the area that we live in. You know, close proximity to the shore. If we were to lose our property insurance because of this site, what can be done? Is Global going to pay our insurance? Are they going to find us an insurance company? We're going to be out of luck. We won't have any coverage at all. So that's my biggest fear. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katie Bruch now McCullum, and I've lived in Clinton since I got brought home from the hospital in 1980, and I lived down the street from Unilever, then Pond. Um, I now live at Knollwood Drive, 15 Knollwood Drive, and I and my neighbor, who will be the next to speak, are the closest houses on Knollwood Drive to the entrance to the facility, being approximately a thousand feet from our homes, where a two, a three, and a seven-year-old currently reside. Um, I actually am not rising for that purpose, because that would be selfish. My husband actually is currently working on a tugboat carrying global fuel. And I am not against the industry. I'm not against fuel. And I am in favor of alternate fuel sources. I am not in favor of having it this close to residents. I am also a daughter-in-law of Mainers. And I know how close the main facilities are to properties. And that is not close because Mainers would not allow that. The facilities are not near homes because of the danger that could happen in the event of an explosion. And I love to hear that those are rare possibilities and we have taken into consideration every possibility that has happened in former accidents. That's because those occurred and then they reacted to those to create alternate sources of protection. But that is not to say that another one could not happen that the fail-safes are not perfect, that there is not someone who could mess up, some electronic deficiency. We lost power for a week in the last two hurricanes and blizzards. I was without power for a week with a two and three year old, but I didn't have to worry about their safety. And I did not have to worry about the children in the Bounce Fund Center across the street. And I can guarantee you, no other businesses are going to want the properties that are across from my house where the moving company and bounce fund center were, and I can guarantee you those people will not want to have their businesses that close to this kind of facility. So I do not rise because I have a two and a three year old within a thousand feet of this facility. I rise because I'm a Clinton resident, and as much as you have the power to make this decision and you want the income for our town, I would rather be the person that voted no and lost $100,000 a year in revenue then I lost children, I lost property, and I caused a catastrophe because I voted yes. Wow. Hello, my name is Paul Tavoda. I live at 13 Nova Drive. Um, Katie's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, like she said, I have a seven-year-old son. I have one on the way. We are the last driveway before you get to the end of our road. Um, it upsets me this is going here. My, my seven-year-old was just here with me. He asked about the safety of his dog. That's all I really have to say. Katie covered everything for me. But, you know, I'm mainly concerned with the safety of living in a proximity. A thousand feet is nothing if this any accident was to happen. That plastic hose that carries pressure that keeps the valves open, no way plastic melts faster than propane explodes. No way. Is there anyone else speaking in opposition? directly across from Windermere, directly across the street from the A1 station. Uh, by concern, we pay quite a bit of tax on that property. 
When you think of $100,000, we pay roughly $16,000 in property tax on the piece of land. Now, if we can't get in, we pay $10,000 in insurance already. Uh, if you, if this is so dangerous that we can't get insurance and the prices of property and homes goes way down and people have to leave their property, can't sell it or whatever, you're going to lose all that tax revenue and $100,000 from this facility is going to be diddly squat because you won't be able to insure your property and you won't be able to sell your property. And this, one of the best resources we have in Connecticut is Hammond Acid State Park. And you're endangering that. That is one of the few facilities that we have to go and go to the shore if you don't own shore property here at $2 million a clip if you want to live on the ocean. That's the only facility that Connecticut really has to enjoy the shoreline. And, th and this facility is just totally inappropriate in such a populated area. It should be in a very secluded place where there's not, not a big population. Not every, every life is precious, but you, you, you could literally destroy this, this entire shoreline. Madison, everything that's down here that we enjoy throughout the whole summer and the rest of the year. So, you know, you're gonna gain 100,000, but you could lose all the revenue from all the, mo the money that all the other taxpayers pay too, because they'll have to leave. Which is what I want to say. Hi, um, my name is Ellen Lowe, and I live on Pratt Road. And just a couple of things. Um, I hear the trains, I hear the noise. I don't know what the light pollution might be from this site. Um, that has been a concern. I worked for 10 years to protect the river um, with um, Citizens for Clean Hammonasset and also for Stop for His Walled Over Development. So I'm not new to some of these potential threats um, to our area. Um, one of the things that had happened um, with um, Unilever was that it was given carte blanche by the DEP. And, and my concern, I don't know what kind of regulations um, are for some facility like this. Um, from the DEP, from other governing um, forces in the state, but I, I know what problems we had with Unilever dumping into Hayden's Creek, and I know the way they tried to solve it, and I know that those things were so difficult to change. And I feel as though the town really isn't operating necessarily in our best interests. It doesn't mean this board. It just means in general, um, it, too many things are coming up that we seem to have to fight. Um, one of the things that was happening um, on, on about Hayden's Creek and, and um, Unilever um, was that they were self-regulated. They were given the opportunity to regulate their own sites. And that was one of the huge problems because they just could sign off with the DEP all the time, every year. Um, and things were happening that dumping into our creek that still hasn't been cleaned up. This kind of huge facility um, seems like a crazy place to, to put this in our area. To say nothing of the fact that I've heard that there are going to be large new businesses uh, <laughs> being constructed along Route 1, which are already going to impact um, our traffic. So we, we pull that together. The people in our area are never going to be able to get out on Route 1. We're going to have to turn right before we go around to come all the way back around and go into Madison. So, so I know that's been spoken about before, but not about the new construction that may also um, be put on Route 1. Right across, perhaps, right across the street, you have, um, I, I'm, I could go on and on. I'm not gonna do it, <laughs> but thank you very much. I just want to note that there are certain criteria that have to be met before a special exception, which this is, uh, is granted. 
And I think you will hear some of this criteria being discussed with the members of the commission when our turn comes. And depending on what those answers are, we, are going to be, we will be swayed one way or the other. So be assured that this is not just done willy-nilly or that we gauge the sentiment in the room and go with that or we look at uh, increases in the potential tax base and base it on that. There are certain, certain strict criteria that we need to apply and we'll make sure we do that. Okay? Uh, Andrew Hulander, uh, on the property 2627 Nolwood Drive. The business has been there for uh, since 1973. Uh, so we're kind of used to the, the truck traffic from uh, Bostitch and the trains coming through, but that's nowhere near the volume of trucks and stuff that would be going through with the gas facility. I mean, it's not, not the volume that's going through there now. I mean, those trucks, the big heavy trucks, really trash the end of the road. Um, there's a small bridge going across the creek there. Um, it's just a lot of traffic for for that area, for that road. I mean, I know it's an industrial area. I mean, my business is down there. Uh, used to industrial things going, you know, big trucks, noisy trains, all that sort of stuff. But it just seems like a lot of things, not to mention the inherent danger of a propane facility that size. About all I have to say, but thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you. It, it seems that we're being a little redundant at times over certain topics. I'm going to ask you, please, to refrain from doing so. We'll be here all night. There are a lot of people here. Um, I don't mind hearing your concerns, and obviously, there's a lot of passion involved in all this. I completely understand. I think all the commissioners understand, but. We've heard already about the traffic concerns, the trucks, and how the trucks impact the roads. Um, so if you're going to address that again, I don't think it's necessary. I think we got it. And I can assure you, some of us, if not all of us here, have thought about that as well. So. Oh, sure. You say that now that I get up here. Uh, Jenny Townsend, I live in Clinton. I don't live anywhere near the facility that's proposed. Um, but I would like to emphasize, Nancy's exactly right. It's going to be very, very difficult for you all who do live on Millwood Road in your real estate values and what you can expect to sell or have interest in your homes. I understand it, does, it didn't fall on you to notify people on Millwood Road about this um, upcoming proposed project. But I do, I do have a sense that if it was such a great project it, that the company would have sent letters to people on Knollwood saying, this is what we're proposing at the end of your street. And even though you know it's a, com you know, it's a commercial zone area, we would like to address those concerns and give you some heads up on it instead of it being found out on Facebook or snuck in at the back door um, way that it was. And I also would like to say, I understand that it's a, it's a proposal that it, it will require special exception. Um, but there's also, and I've heard all of the, you know, this works great here because it meets this criteria and that. But there's an old saying that goes, just because it can be done doesn't mean it should be done. So I am very much opposed to it and of all the concerns, and I hope I have been too redundant. Fred Bauer, uh, well, once again across the street from Gator Creek, my wife just spoke, but here's a concept. What happens if there's so much need for propane that suddenly there's way more than 20 trucks today? Or there's way more than 16 cars or whatever they're going to bring in, and the trucks and the trains, and it just doubles and triples. So that those trucks are coming in and out of that street every 15 minutes in the winter time. And you're hearing the railroad cars. And it, they just, they just, they just gave us a, a figure of about possibly uh, 20 trucks in the winter time a day. But, you know, the need for gas, people stop using oil with the price of the oil, more people switch to gas, that could easily double. It could easily triple. Those train cars could triple. It could be way dangerous. 
And that that road, we know, that road coming out of there, the trucks have to swing practically over into the lane of McDonald's if it's a tractor trailer truck. Because I remember that being the case when Spedley was there. They always had to go way out into the road to make the turn. Somebody coming along doesn't realize the truck's there, smashes it into one of those propane trucks right in front of McDonald's. It wouldn't be a nice scene. Thank you. My name is Terry Rourke. I live on Harbor Parkway, and I've lived in Clinton since 2009, so I'm a newbie. Um, I, in the short time I have lived in Clinton, I've already had to change my homeowner's insurance, both for wind protection and flood insurance. And I'm wondering if uh, wind code for the building has been addressed, you know, in the event of more than a tropical storm hits our shoreline for flood and building code requirements for a more severe storm in this type of building. So that would be one of my questions I'd like to see answered. Anyone else speak against the application? Yes, sir. Did you sign it? Yes, he's already signed. Yes, he's already signed. Yes, he's already signed. <laughs> Just waiting my turn. Uh, good evening, everyone, and commissioners. Um, thank you for uh, letting me speak, and uh, forgive my back if I face the others. Um, I have the privilege this evening, my name is Keith Ainsworth um, of Evans, Feldman, and Ainsworth, a law firm in New Haven. Uh, but I live just across the uh, river in Madison, um, and I've, uh, raised, I'm raising a family here in the shoreline as well. Um, I have the privilege of representing a group of folks called the Hammond Environmental Trust. It's a combination of folks, uh, your neighbors, uh, some of whom are from Clinton, some of whom are from Madison, uh, but we all live on the shoreline and, and that artificial divide on the river um, is just a natural feature. Uh, when it comes to something like this that affects us all, we are neighbors. And like I said, I have the privilege of representing uh, these folks who have banded together and put their own um, time, effort, and money into researching and uh, presenting, uh, let's say, a, a a perspective that, that isn't someone who's on the payroll of the gas industry. Um, and for the edification of the, of the commission, one of the uh, primary concerns here is safety. Um, you've heard a lot about it and people expressing concerns, but we brought here someone, uh, Mr. Rob uh, Lewandowski from uh, Fuss and O'Neill, which is a, a, uh, an environmental consulting firm here in Connecticut, uh, and he's a fire safety expert. And what I'd like to do is have him address some of the things that you've had questions about or concerns that you've raised, and um, maybe even contrast that with what you heard earlier. I'll put this in the back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Could you spell this out for me? Mr. Lewandowski? Lewandowski. Lewandowski. Did he sign in? Can I have him sign in too? Yeah, we'll. Um, he will be uh, leaving with some written materials. Um, Can you all hear me? No. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Lewandowski, while you proceed, would you mind sharing with us your expert qualifications so we can give them due weight? Uh, good evening. My name is Robert Lewandowski. I'm a vice president with Fuss and O'Neill Consulting Engineers in Manchester. I've been in the fire service for over 30 years. I teach at the Connecticut Fire Academy. I teach uh, pre previously taught graduate uh, studies at the University of New Haven in fire science, specifically in special hazards control. Um, trying to think if you need, I'm on the uh, Capital Region uh, Hazardous Materials Emergency Response Team. 
So when you have an emergency in, in my area of the woods, northern Connecticut, I'm on the team that you call. I'm a board certified safety professional. I'm a board certified industrial hygienist. And I teach around the United States and stuff like this. All right. So what I have is I, I have some information. And um, I think what's important to keep in, into perspective, I'm, I'm going to um, reference uh, some information related to the design. I have not seen the design documents, and I actually don't know that they're, uh, they're uh, not credible. I, I think they're probably very credible, and I think they follow the installation standard which they're supposed to follow. I have no doubt in that. Um, what I think has been missing, uh, and it's sort of been alluded to, and I'll go into two different aspects, is we haven't talked about the transportation hazards We've talked about transportation and how it hits roads and all that other stuff, but we haven't talked about what's the potential of fire to the transport vehicle while it's coming into our town. The installation is, follows the code, but from my experience being in the fire service, it's the tractor trailer truck that's gonna catch on fire that we're gonna have to deal with, that we're gonna ask our fire service to go put out. I actually, around the corner met with one of the Clinton Fire Department guys at dinner at Subway. And I said, hey, so what do you guys have for special training? He said, oh, we're all firefighter too. The information that I'm going to put into the board tonight will show that when we teach firefighter two, the second level of fire training at the Connecticut Fire Academy, it's not on bulk propane storage. It's on the 20 pound propane cylinder that we have for our gas grill. So we're expecting people who are in our town to volunteer to go to this bulk storage facility. They're not trained for that. The fire protection may be installed following the, the criteria of 58 or NFPA 58. I don't doubt that. What, what are we asking the emergency responders to do? What's the likelihood of that tractor trailer truck having some type of emergency? Pretty common. Also going into, into the information that I have is is um, uh, from Guilford. J.J. Uh, Sullivan was putting in some uh, oil tanks 2012. I was on part of the organization to, to educate the public on that, which was defeated. And when you look at the, uh, when you look at the, uh, the, the fire report, I, uh, I have the, the fire report from a, uh, an accident back in Guilford. The truck, the trailer was not compromised. The trailer was intact. It was turned over and it was slightly damaged. They closed Amtrak and they closed the downtown for 18 and a half hours. I can't ask, what part of town do we want to close for 18 and a half hours? Does that affect your business? You bet it does. Does uh, I-95, when the two tractor trailer trucks in East Line, northbound, southbound, what happened to the, to the rearrangement of traffic and the pattern that had to go through Waterford, New London, East Lime, up uh, 161 through Montville? All of those types of considerations. You don't have those planned provisions in your town. You don't have an emergency plan that addresses that. I, I think that, that the fire marshal looked at the arrangement and it says that it complies with from his criteria 58 and it probably does i think there's a lot more to the public safety aspect what i added here um that we also use for presentations uh in the in the town of guilford and in chester and in some other locations and, and we've heard tonight if we have a if we have a blevy and again a, a blevy is not easy to occur it's something that actually takes a lot of energy to do. But if you have a blevy, I've given you two illustrations. The, the top illustration is only related to one rail car. I really don't think that there's a likelihood of all of these tanks, 540,000 gallons, bleving all at the same time. There are multiple tanks. And I think that's pretty important to keep it in perspective. You could have an incident with a tank or some type of transport vehicle or a rail car or something like that. The existing tank that's there, I believe, is also 30,000 gallons. Look at a rail car, it's around 30,000 gallons. 
What you see here is a bloody impact of uh, 30,000 gallons. Um, and, and you can see how far that impact spreads out into the community. More important though, and, and might be hard to see, is the bottom. The bottom is a regular, is a 311, what we use in the, for transporting propane. That's the blevy that you have to follow through your community. This is the blevy that travels up Route 1, Main Street, goes up the Hammonasset Connector, goes down 95. That's the, that's the moving blevy. Wherever you have a tractor trailer truck going, this follows. This is it. So you have to ask yourself, are we prepared wherever that truck goes, are we prepared to address that emergency wherever it is? And again, I, I don't know the route. I haven't seen a traffic study, so I don't know how they plan to get all the vehicles here. But however they get here, well, you need to if you need to take this this dispersion model and you need to put it with that truck, and that's pretty important. Um, obviously, there's an impact. There's surely the potential that you have. I. I uh, there, there was a uh, part of the um, submission should be, and I think it was mentioned, was the fire safety analysis. Fire safety analysis is very important. So I, I, again, I think since I don't know if it was submitted, I haven't seen it, but I think the analysis needs to be needs to be reviewed. So I, I think when you, when you look really at the hazards that you have going back to the rail car in the special use criteria 9.2.3, there's a provision is made that. No one do hazard to traffic, and I, I don't have all the words written down, but yeah, no one do um, hazard to traffic should exist. And I, I think when you look at the transportation side, today, you, you don't have that hazard. Add in a couple of trucks, I, I think you're creating that hazard. I think you're bringing that in, introducing that into your, um, into your community. There is, uh, you can go on, to, you know, uh, being in the fire service, there's a there's a lot of information that's out there, and I'll bring it to, to the community for your planning. The April 2012 edition of Fire Engineering talks about propane emergencies planned for the worst case scenario. And I think uh, if you haven't read it, it, it's worth it to read. It's worth it to go through to find out what should your community be planning for if you're going to be introducing all appropriate into your facility, is, or into your town. What is that source again? I'm sorry, it's the April, 12, uh, April 2012 fire engineering. Are you going to leave those materials for us? Yes, sir. So, some of the other closing comments that I have is, is um, it's unclear, actually, the, the total amount of propane that's being brought on site. I've heard, um, I've heard uh, 16 rail cars, maybe each 30,000 gallons. I don't know if they're all here at the same time. Uh, 12 fixed facilities, uh, tanks. So it's not clear what the true volume of propane is here. And I, I think that's something that should also be clarified whether it's 540,000 gallons of fixed, plus whatever's in the rail cars, plus with different tractor trailer trucks. Uh, it sounds like it's a different number. I, again, I haven't seen what those plans are. Sounds like it's a lot. And then again, the, the, the water safety, again, th there is an analysis that goes through the, uh, in the uh, fire safety analysis goes through water supply. And again, I, I actually agree with the supply analysis. You'll have to, I'm pretty confident of the existing Plumbing probably isn't going to do it. So that's, but that's, again, they, they have someone who's looking at that. My experience um, from the emergency services side, again, uh, I, I live in northern Connecticut, and in my community, we, uh, we have ammonia is our problem. And it, uh, it, it never fails that while we install systems meeting the standard accidents do happen we evacuated several thousand people in our community for an ammonia release back uh, several years ago and um while i would say we're a really in ellington and while we're a really progressive fire department 
We were absolutely ill-prepared for that event. And we had fire departments from all over the place. The rail cars. Uh, no, that was a, uh, we had a gasket release actually in a compressor. And then we ended up evacuating our, well, a quarter of our town anyway. You know, it, the conformance of the installation code does not guarantee safety. It is an installation code, and, and we, we fail to take in the human aspect of that, the interaction of people. Um, go to the gas station, you'll see people smoking while they're filling their car. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I actually saw an article over on the tabletop related to the 20-pound propane cylinder that just levied in uh, South Middletown. I was actually on the, I was on the phone with uh, Chief uh, Rob Ross, who used to be the state fire marshal. In Connecticut, I was on the phone with him earlier today talking about putting in this amount of material. So again, I, I think you need to look at the risks to the community and and um, go back to looking at the human involvement. Thank you. Thank you. Before he leaves, can he explain what a blevy is? Just to tell people what that is. Sure. Blevy is the acronym for a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. And if you look at a uh, look at the propane tank that you have at your house, probably if, if we all have that type of propane tank, tanks have a relief valve on them, and it's to control over pressurization. In that cylinder, you have a certain amount of liquid. And when you open up the cylinder, uh, when you open up the valve on the top, gas is released, which boils the liquid propane that's in your cylinder. When you have direct flame contact onto a cylinder, that cylinder, that, that uh, liquid in the cylinder boils. Boiling liquid, it expands, the relief valve opens, and, and when you have a uh, compromised cylinder, typically through uh, direct flame contact, that cylinder, if the relief valve can't control the amount of uh, liberating gas, then you get a, a, a vapor explosion. That's probably the one minute version. You might want to ask, it's, pr it's probably a, a good way to explain it. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else want to, you want to that? Yeah, I do have some comments that address the application directly. Yes, he was not the only speaker. Okay. Do you want to give us the legal component? Is that what you want to do? Yes. Is that all right? Are you comfortable up there? No, no, they're Chairman, for uh, indulging me one more time. Um, we filed with the Commission uh, a brief in, in opposition, which is an explanation of our position. Um, the intervention petition is just sort of the entry way into the proceedings uh, on, on environmental grounds. But uh, I, I recommend the, the reading of the, uh, of the brief. It goes into more detail than I'll go into now, but I want to hit some highlights. Um, I've been an environmental attorney for 24 years in Connecticut, and uh, and I've been doing land use for for the same period of time. Oh, thought I was hitting. Right, I'm not used to the microphone. <laughs> um, the commission is reminded that this is a special exception permit, and that um, that means it's not as of right. But the applicant tried to suggest that this is an application that it meets the standards for the special exceptions that you somehow must approve or that somehow signals that the use is appropriate at this location. I think that was the quote I heard. And actually that's not true. Uh, I, I disagree strenuously on that one because the applicant is is sort of hanging their head on the fact that it's an existing I-1 zone, it's an industrial uh, location, and that this use is somehow compatible because it, it will meet the codes. Um, first, it has to, the, the the main special exception uh, standard that you have to judge is whether it's in harmony with the existing or pre-existing surrounding uses. And you've got an industrial parcel that happens to be adjacent to, abutting, 
two residential neighborhoods, one in Madison, um, it technically abuts because the, the line's there, but that's not a magic uh, divider. They abut, they're the nearest neighbor to uh, this facility. And on the other side, you have uh, another residential community in Clinton. Those are legitimate uses that, that currently exist and they're entitled to, to have the expectations of their use. Same with the commercial uses around them. And this facility, because it poses a threat, and it's not that it's a common threat, it's gonna happen you know, once a week, but the fact is there's a threat there that is so enormous that it, even the small risk that it poses of actually happening is unacceptable, because if it happens, it's catastrophic. Also, you've been, it, you've been told that this is a, about a half million gallon facility, 540,000 gallons. But if you notice in, West, in Westboro, they expanded to a million. Um, once they get their foot in the door, they get their special exception, you've approved it for that use. Um, if, what ha if what they intend to happen, happens, they, they're building this facility to meet the state's push for um, propane. Uh, they're, they're moving to natural gas to replace uh, oil. States picked that winner. But the fact is, if they put this facility in to be a regional facility, there's a very good likelihood that people are going to be tapping into that. Natural gas is cheaper, if it's available, people will go for it. And then you've got increased customers, you've got increased demand, and even with the existing size of the facility, you can increase the truck traffic. You're not limiting that. Um, and perhaps the, the commission should consider limiting the truck traffic. Um, The applicant says that they'll comply with EPA, DOT, whatever federal and state regulations exist. Um, and that means that you, PNZ, shouldn't be concerned because it's really not in your purview. Um, you know, they, this is being taken care of by, by higher and, and better authorities. But what that really means is, is Global will try to comply with these. They don't guarantee it. Nobody can. It's, it's dependent on human, human efforts. Um, and They'll try to comply with those regulations, except for the ones that they've asked you to be exempt from. Uh, they didn't come here saying they would comply with all of Clinton's regulations. They, what they wanted was an exemption from the landscaping plan, they wanted an exempt, exemption from the fencing, um, and they wanted an exemption from the traffic study. Uh, the fencing actually is an interesting one because there's no reason to not have a 14-foot high opaque or, or impervious fence or wall on the far side of the facility facing uh, the river, uh, which faces a residential community. You can still see into the facility if you had a 14-foot uh, high uh, chain link fence. And your regulations to specify a 14-foot high fence. They want to put a six-foot fence. No reason why they couldn't put a 14-foot high chain link fence that works. But they want an exemption from that. They also want an exemption from the traffic study. The traffic study, in terms of 20 trucks, I don't know what the traffic impact, certainly not from a, a volume standpoint is, but certainly from a, an explosion hazard or a crash hazard, nobody's at, analyzed that. Nobody's telling you where these trucks are going. A traffic study would do that. No one's telling you whether they're going to go right or left. Nobody's going to tell you what roads they're going to travel on. I suspect that's because if these folks knew, they'd be more concerned because they'd know that it would be going near them. Um, even if Global's uh, compliance efforts work with regard to the NFPA, they can't control the fact that someone who might be drunk, someone who might be careless, someone who's texting on their phone, someone who's doing whatever, crashes into one of these vehicles carrying this. That's an explosion hazard. And as Mr. Lewandowski pointed out, you're introducing the hazard. Yes, there may be propane delivery trucks coming in now, but it's a very limited number. By introducing this facility, which is going to serve as a much larger area, and nobody's told you how large that area is, but a much larger number of trucks that wouldn't have been here are going to come in and be here loaded with gas. The special exception uh, requires also the application be in harmony with surrounding uses. Um, context matters. You've got Bo the Bostitch site is surrounded by marshes. If you look at their maps, they don't show you the whole site. They actually don't show you the surrounding uses. They really truncated on their on their uh, diagrams. They show you just the area where the, where the tanks are. Um, what they don't show you is the, is the really close proximity, and I think there have been some submissions of maps that show you the close proximity of residential uh, communities. Also, I'd say that 
context further matters that this is a contaminated site. And while it's the previous owner that was responsible for cleaning it up, they started that analysis 18 years ago. Um, if you look on the, on the DEP's list of potentially ha or, um, of hazardous uh, waste facilities, they started their investigation in 1996, and when they did a land transfer, they did one, they started again in 1999. <coughs> Um, it took them a very, very long time to get around to doing something, and I suspect only because they thought they might get a chance of, of reusing the property. If, however, you approve this, you are, in effect, giving them an, an ability to cash out, and that gives them, let's say, less incentive to uh, fulfill those obligations. When they, when they want to do something in the future, they, they try to comply, but once they've got there, um, I don't know that you'll be able to uh, bank on that guarantee that they'll continue. Um, more important, your special exceptions uh, standards require that this facility be uh, in concert with the plan of conservation and development, which includes your municipal coastal plan. And the municipal coastal plan says that you're supposed to um, or discourage new non-water dependent uses in the coastal zone. This site is in the coastal zone, it's next to the coastal marshes. This facility um, is it not water dependent, which means it doesn't need water to operate. It's not a marina, it's not something that you need water transport, it's rail transport. And while it obviously fits within the rail that's next to it, it doesn't fit within the water dependent uses. And your, uh, your standards on that require that you assess the view, the impact of the views from and to the water. Well, this facility is going to be built, it, um, I believe someone testified that you can't see it from across the river. Um, actually, I've stood in uh, across the river at uh, Aylesbury Way and, and the neighbors and looked across. You can see right into the area where this facility will be. Um, there's actually a direct line of sight from the, where the proposed tanks are to residences. Um, and certainly from people who are on the river, if you're, and that's actually what the CAM Act is concerned about, is, is people recreating and using the natural uh, resources. Um, this facility doesn't take that into account. Um, so it's inconsistent with the CAM Act. And this is also a CAM Act application, which is a separate consideration that this commission must give. Um, and you have to rule that it's inconsistent with the policies of the Coastal Area Management Act. And it's not, because that also, like your own regulations, requires that um, new uses in the coastal zone not be non-water dependent. Um, the applicant has also said that they're not going to um, put in a 50-foot vegetative buffer, buffer like your um, zoning regulation 10.3.7, uh, 37.2 requires. A vegetative buffer can be something that ameliorates the, impact, the visual impacts of this facility. Um, and it's something that ought to be considered. <clears throat> Of greater concern is that um, there's been no fire safety plan. And the applicant has said, well, we only have to comply with the 1995 version of the, or 1996 version of the NFPA 58. There's a 2014 version. And one would think that if you were a responsible industry, you would follow the latest and best version of the applicable standards. And to say, well, no, it's only required in Connecticut to follow that. Um, and we're not going to do any more. Um, is, I think, a question that you ought to think about. Um, in, the, in the 2014 version, a fire safety analysis would be required, and that fire safety analysis would give you a lot more detail about what these operations are, and I, and I go into detail in my brief about that. I'm not gonna um, repeat that. But what they do in their, in their application is they provide you with the titles that would go in that fire safety operations report, but they don't provide you with the meat of it. The titles don't help, don't help you, don't give you sufficient information upon which you could base a, a, a rational decision. Um, and I'm going to just hit a couple of items I wrote down during some of the testimony, and I'll be done. With it. I appreciate the, uh, the indulgence. As for notice, by the way, um, someone mentioned that uh, they weren't given enough notice by the 
about this. And I know the Commission's perspective is, well, we follow the regulations. We'll, we'll concede that perhaps you did. Um, but there's no restriction on anybody in the fire department, the selectman's office, any other part of town government, economic development. There's no other restriction on anyone else who wasn't able to, um, you know, who was restricted in any way from notifying the public in a greater way. Obviously, people are concerned. Um, well, you appreciate that we are limited by what we do, lest we create the impression of prejudice. Absolutely, I don't. I, it would not be appropriate for the, for this commission to go further than, than what you did. Thank you. Assuming that you complied with all of the notice requirements in the regulations. Um, so. I guess to conclude, this is not an appropriate use for this location. If this industrial zone were located somewhere remotely, if it were in a place where it was away from uh, adjoining residential uh, uses, you could, you could do this facility and all it would threaten is trees and perhaps some animals. But you're, you've got a facility that is hemmed in, it's maybe 37 acres, but the borders of this property and this facility itself, where these tanks are going, is only hundreds of feet from homes. And it, so they are within, and they can't move. They've been there, they bought, they had the expectation that they would have in a residential zone that maybe there would be an industrial facility here, but I don't think anyone um, expected that a commission, that, some, that their own neighbors would approve something that would put them in a direct, direct line of harm. I can, I can sympathize that Clinton wants to replace Stanley Bostich in its, in its underutilized site. Towns always want to uh, you know, increase their revenue. Um, I, I was first selected in the town of Haddam, and I, I know the challenges uh, that, that, that towns face to reduce taxes. But it's precisely in times like these when you can be tempted to approve something that you wouldn't do if times were different. My clients ask you to deny this use as not in harmony with the pre-existing neighboring residential uses. Thank you. Okay, if we're done with uh, speakers in opposition, I would like to allow the applicant to rebut comments that they heard at this time. Is there anyone else that wants to speak in opposition? Is there anyone else that wants to speak in opposition? I can't. I can't hear you, sir. Yes, you can make a general comment. <coughs> So anyone that wants to make, once I'm done asking whether there's anybody in opposition. For the third time, is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition of this application? That hasn't spoken. All right, now general comments. Anybody wants to make general yeah, comments, that's neither that's for that's or against? I think you care. Actually, we can't hear you, sir. Can you come up? <laughs> Can you please sign this, sir? We sign it first, okay. Which one? I need to put the scene Neither pro nor con, you're going to have a hundred thousand dollars of increased income, which has been stated several times. What what is the gross? Because you're that's the gross, but you're also going to have some expenses, maybe some insurance, maybe some loss of property value, certainly road expense. Could you publish a little estimate of the increased expense uh, over to have this plant or this? gas facility there uh, against the hundred thousand because you're not going to net a hundred thousand thank you 
Anyone else with general comments or questions? Yes, I do. My name is Jonathan Malazzi. I've been a resident in this town for 39 years. I was brought up here. Um, to be honest with you, I'm uh, at this point I'm not pro or con for this project. I've been listening to uh, everything that everyone has to say here. I have a couple, I've got a couple of notes. Uh, I own a small group exercise facility on Nod Road, which is directly across the train tracks from the proposed site. Um, the pros are obviously that I see, and I'll keep this real brief. Obviously, tax revenue, usage of the property for the town, I understand that, and I think it will bring in more revenue. The, the cons that people are talking about are safety. Obviously, it's a big concern. It's propane. A couple of points briefly uh, was the probability of an explosion. Um, our government, the, the state of Connecticut, is uh, trying to run natural <coughs> gas lines throughout the state. In fact, they are installing natural gas lines in the Windermere community. Uh, it was last year that a, a uh, building in the Bronx or the Brooklyn blew up, blew up from an explosion from natural gas. So uh, there are concerns about that. I think if they do their due diligence and follow through with that, uh, safety should probably be uh, a concern. But I think if it's done properly, it may not be as big as a concern. The other issue that uh, I heard recently was the transports or the vehicles. They um, Obviously, there will be excess of vehicles moving around the... Uh, the town. In retrospect, you've got to look at gasoline trucks that uh, transport gasoline, which is just as volatile and flammable throughout the entire shoreline, the state of Connecticut, the United States. How many thousands of trucks will be uh, uh, transporting or are transporting gasoline versus these uh, 26 trucks that they're uh, calculating that will deliver the propane? Um, being a resident and dealing with traffic and, and that sort of stuff. My biggest concern is the traffic, and I know I'm not going to reiterate on those things briefly. Um, I ask that the commission, if they do decide to go with this, that they do limit it to wholesale distribution of this gas. If they were to start distributing this propane to independent dealers and little trucks, you can imagine the amount of vehicle traffic that's going to go down there is going to be probably quadrupled uh, or even more than that with uh, all this local traffic. So I think that's in consideration, again, if it's accepted or thought about, they should limit it to wholesale uh, propane, and, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you already speak? I have a question. Okay. You said neither pro nor con. So while I was against, I do have a question. Point of information is whether there are any plans to widen the road, given the fact that in the current conditions, when there is industrial traffic, I am unable to pass without moving to the side of the road for the trucks to clear the trees that are on the side of the road as well as the widening, uh, the, the width of the road. Um, secondly, if there were to be two propane trucks in passing, one entering and one leaving, would they be able to do safely um, next to one another? Because right now the road is not wide enough for two industrial trucks to pass. And my other um, point of information would be um, during the winter months when the snow passage or um, plowing prevents the road from being completely cleared, that would also further narrow the road. So I was wondering if there were plans to widen the road at any point. I see someone else coming down the aisle. Say or ask a question? Oh, maybe ask a question, but I just I like to ask a question. <clears throat> uh, all night we have been listening <laughs> to all kinds of uh, concerns, questions, and I would like to know if the, uh, the, the company that's trying to take over this property uh, will address all of the questions that we have here tonight. Um, and if they do, I would like to see if it would be published so that everybody can see what the company plans to do, maybe to correct some of these things, that the questions that, that some of these people have had uh, tonight. Uh, people are putting the questions before you, and, uh, and I know the company can't probably answer them all right tonight, but I would like to know if the company would uh, counteract and uh, put out something uh, about all the concerns that the people have in Madison as well as Clinton. I can
can assure you that as soon as we're done with these questions, uh, they can begin to answer uh, the questions, not only questions you posed as an audience, pro and con, but also the questions that the commissioners are probably waiting with bated breath to ask. <laughs> Since we're going to make the decision. Okay, anyone else? First of all, I'd like to thank the environmental attorney who went through, obviously, a lot of work. And I hope that all of you listen to that specialist, right? Somebody who knows about this stuff. I know you've ignored that kind of stuff in the past. And citizens like me have had to throw in my own hard-earned dollars to send a lawyer's letter to this commission because they ignored important things like he outlined here. There's a legal process for this also. But I think it's important if you live near or concerned about legalities that, you know, there, there's ways to go over what this commission decides. I hope the commission decides in the, uh, what is in the best interest of all of the residents of this town. And I would ask also that the commission um, remember that you're going to be laying this down in an area where there's other proposed development. For example, um, we've been talking for a long time in this town about a uh, ice skating rink. Uh, the proximity to that, uh, to this proposed site, I think would kill that project. Uh, so, yep, we might get a little chunk of money from this. You know, we're the cheapest town on the shoreline. Of course, we're the targets of these kind of environmentally risky projects. Ma'am, sounds like you're opposing it. I'm opposing it, but I have that question for the commission, and I'd like to remind you what your job is. Clinton, I'm from Clinton. <laughs> okay. Any more? Can this come for a referendum? No, no, it doesn't work that way. Why not? It, it doesn't. It's a special exception application. It's power that's granted to all planning and zoning commissions in the state of Connecticut by law. Okay. Uh, there has to be a process. This is the process that people wiser than us put in place. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. It doesn't sound like there's any more uh, questioning or comments that are semi-neutral. I will allow now the uh, applicant to rebut any, all, some of the questions and issues that have been raised during the commentary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and, and members of the commission and the audience, um, we would like to do as um, the gentleman just suggested, and um, since this hearing is going to be continued, we would like to answer all the questions that have been raised and answer them in writing, and we will submit that to the commission, and then anyone who would like to come in and see it um, may certainly come in and review the answers, and I'm sure we'll be discussing them at the next meeting. There have been a lot of things raised, and for us to try and start answering all those questions tonight is going to be scrambled and disorganized, and um, we can do a better job than that with a little time to prepare a response. Um, but I think Mr. Remley would like to respond to just a couple of things that came up um, this evening. Uh, just one in particular, the, uh, the comment that we did not do a fire safety analysis and that this is being built in conformance with 1995 NFPA standards, that is factually incorrect. The fire safety analysis was completed, it's been submitted both to the town of Clinton and the town of Madison and the respective fire chiefs, and it's being built in conformity with both the 95 and 2014 standards. So I just would like to clarify that. As, uh, as Ms. Whitney said, we'll get back to you with with uh, answers to your questions or attempt to answer all the questions and issues that were, uh, were raised. I think to do so right now would, uh, would appear scattered. Some of them we're not going to be able to answer off the cuff and, uh, and consequently would like to, uh, to take the time and do it thoughtfully and get back to the town and to the people who have taken the time to show up here and write. Let's 
Well, does that conclude your rebuttal? Oh, sorry, one, no, one more thing. However, I, I'm sure that the commission members have questions, and I wonder if you could ask us some of those questions tonight so that we can add those to our, to our responses to submit um, for the next time. Well, one, one point I wish to make to the entire commission is we have the option of requiring a traffic study. Uh, I think there's been a request in this application for us to waive a traffic study, correct? Correct, and the town planner suggested that no traffic study was needed. I understand, but that's an opinion, True. and we may, as a commission, have a different one. So I leave it up to the commissioners to decide whether we ought to have a traffic study, and we can take it to a vote if that's your wish. We're at a public hearing. We're at a public hearing, but we can we can request a traffic study if we have a general consensus that we should have. I would absolutely insist on traffic study. You know, there's an impact on both directions, east, west, um, north, south. Um, trying to connect to 95, um, pedestrian, bicycle, you know, I, I, <laughs> I've brought up many times any large proposals in the town. Yeah, I, just think it's I, would, I would absolutely concur because the other thing that is brought up tonight is we don't know at this point what the potential could be if there was more than the proposed facility that was expanded. So certainly at this point, um, and given what I've heard from different people tonight, I absolutely think a traffic study is essential. I also would like to uh, request a traffic study. Yes, All right, I think the general can Mr. Yeah. Kirk, Mr. I, Carr. I would add to that, I mean, not only I think is uh, Ms. Fritz suggested it not only be for the current facility but also a potential expansion what that would look like and I think it also should include uh, transportation hazard you know what the transportation hazard might be uh, that would go with this uh, kind of traffic uh, I haven't heard from a couple of you but I'm getting the general sense Mr. Staunton I in the traffic study, I'd like to see an analysis of the, the existing roadway width and turning templates of the, you know, the incoming and outgoing trucks so that we can verify that they'll be able to fit on the existing roadway. If, if a road widening is part of this project, it should be documented at, at this point, I guess. And in addition to that, I'd like to see a, uh, a turning template analysis of Route 1 in Knollwood Drive so that we can make sure that those trucks that are going westbound on Route 1 will be able to make that corner. Mr. Remley, are you taking this all in? I'm taking it all in, sir. And obviously we're being recorded so you can consult with the uh, recording once it's available if you forget any of it. No, and I, again, I would have to make sure you know, some of the things might be outside of the purview of a, of a traffic expert if we're talking about DOT hazard analysis. Um, well, so we're, we're going to be getting a safety engineer, but, fire safety analysis, probably by the next uh, scheduled hearing that we're going to address a little bit later. Understood, so, the, the re understood the request for a comprehensive traffic analysis. Okay, very well. Mr. Chairman, uh, also um, the, uh, the, the exemption for the vegetation, I think that should be put back in, and the fence. Well, the, the fence, I want to address the fence in another manner. Uh, that is a, a legal concern, actually. Uh, Council, you're probably aware of the McKenzie decision. We can't really uh, address uh, any variance, if you want to call it a variance, of a requirement in our, own, in our own regulations. You would have the option of uh, applying for a zoning change to address the fence issue, or you would have the option of uh, withdrawing the application at this time and pursuing an application for a variance with the Zoning Board of Appeals of Clinton. But we cannot, in my understanding of the McKenzie decision and the holding of that decision, we cannot change the requirement for uh, a six-foot fence with three rows of barbed wire and see-through as opposed to what we require presently. 
I, I certainly understand the, uh, the McKenzie issue. Um, there's, a, there's a different issue here, actually, um, and it pertains to um, the, the fence and um, the, the issue of secondary containment and a restriction on the hours when um, rail delivery can come to the property. And the, the issue is that all of those matters are governed by federal law, which preempts local zoning. And so we are speaking with your, um, your, your new planner and your counsel, um, Ken Slater at Halloran and Sage, about how to deal with those issues. And I believe you'll be getting a memo from him very shortly, um, hopefully actually within the next couple of days, to, to deal with that. And, and um, you may want to hear from your, your new zoning enforcement officer on the same issue. Commissioners, oh, yeah, it's open to all of us. I have a sort of two-part question regarding when the um, oh, when the uh, trains are actually delivered to the site. Um, it's not included in the current plan with the times, you know, the op times of operation. So uh, it sounds as though we're going to get further clarification on the rail times um, and what the the parameters are there. Um, when the trains deliver. Um, deliver the propane and it's sitting along the facility, what type of um, mechanisms are in place? You talked a lot about the valves on site. What type of mechanisms are in place to regulate safety when they're in that location? They're not technically, they're, on, they're technically on site, but I just want to further clarify. Just sitting there, you mean? Yeah. So they're waiting before they're unloaded and because they may have shown up at a time that is not within the working hours, is that the question? Does anybody care to answer that at the present from the applicant? Who, whose property would those final trains be on? Their property or a town or somebody else's? Amtrak. Sir? Amtrak. Amtrak ought to be involved. Those, those um, trains would be on our property. Um, there's a rail spur that comes off onto our property and they would be on our property. But that is the issue of when the delivery will be made to the site by rail is one of those things that is preempted by federal law. Um, you have a regulation that says, I can't quote it exactly, but basically it says um, you can't transport product um, onto the site except between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. and the the um, delivery by rail is preempted by federal law and there's there's a lot of actually I mean I don't, I don't want to get into a legal argument because you'll be hearing from your attorney about this but it, it is covered by federal law and can't be limited by uh, by local regulation so and and global won't control that either um, Amtrak will be controlling when the trains can actually come to the property. With respect, someone's got to be there 24 hours a day. <coughs> sir, oh, okay. sir, 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 you know, everybody's been great, and I commend everyone for their courtesy and the way we've carried this hearing all night. I, I don't want it to become a back and forth shouting match. And, and let's let's just keep it uh, courteous. We've done very well so far. I think we can all appreciate uh, your concerns, and obviously they're being raised by the commissioners. And really, it is our turn to ask questions. Mr. Carr, uh, I would like to know a bit more about security. I, we heard a little bit about cameras. I'd like to know a little bit about potential sabotage. I mean, it's one thing when there's an accident from somebody that's careless. It's another thing when somebody decides. They want to target a facility like this, and so I'd like to know a little bit about how that's mitigated. I'd like to know if it's only between your hours of 7 to 8, and what your security is after the hour of 8 o'clock. Is there any security provided after that time? Do you have any employees that are on site 24 hours? That's a question I would have. I think the answer on the 
rail sides, if rail shipments are expected, there'll be someone on, on the closed facilities who will not be taking truck traffic in to receive the rail delivery. Otherwise, the facility will be locked in with security cameras, including the security fencing around the outside of it. So it'll be a fence closed perimeter, propane tanks for fence, there are security cameras in place, and there'll be a, a locked facility. If there's propane cars expected, there'll be a man there to take, uh, to take those, or employee, I should say. But in the event of a safety breach, let's call it, you are depending, it sounds like, on the Clinton Police Department. Correct, not dissimilar than other facilities in town that aren't open 24 hours a day. And I would note the town's own regs require us to be only open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Who's, who's monitoring that? You've got the video. Who's monitoring it in those off those lockup hours? Is There's a, an off-site monitoring company that, uh, no different than an alarm company, off-site monitoring company that would be engaged to do that. So, there, and I can provide you more okay. detail about right. that, sir. But I, that's. Anyone else with questions on the commission? Mark? Yeah, a couple things. Um, by the NFPA 58, is there a requirement for a monitoring system that when it does a a potential leak that it does detect and it goes back to somewhere. Second thing is, you mentioned the trucks. The trucks are going to be 40 foot long or typical transportation trucks with the uh, orders of multiple sizes of trucks coming in. No, the, the trucks entering the facility would be the standard propane fuel trucks that you see on the roads now placarded trucks governed by DOT and Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration standards regarding their movement about the about the roads. On the NFPA side, I'd like to hand it over to, to Nick. He had a question just regarding NFPA standards uh, regarding the Is smell of propane. Is there a monitor system that gets, gets part of the installation that if, if a gas or a propane smell or detection comes out that it goes back to somewhere. Um, but, but it's there, it's possible to install a monitoring system that goes back to the same central alarm company that the closed circuit TVs that can monitor um, any odor. It sets it at a medium level, so that it's, it's possible to put in the addition. We're going to have so a fire monitoring system. Time. So you don't have that. That's place. not part of at this time. At this time, we haven't designed it. So, but it's not. But part then, of with, uh, with with respect, we haven't designed any of the piping, any any of that part yet, because there's no sense doing that part if we don't do this part. So he's asking if the NFPA require it. No, they do not require. It. <coughs> right. no. Um. One thing that somebody did bring up is a, a good question. What happens when a power outage does occur and there's no backup generator or anything that could? What does the system do? Nothing. You can't open the valves if you don't have power to open the valves. Is that because the compressors are not working? That's because the compressors are not working. We can't, as a commission, require it by our town ordinance to put monitor the smell of the gas to set up the alarm. Sure. Well, we can impose conditions if the application were to be uh, approved. Right, sir. So all of these things are possibilities if we were to approve the application. Correct. We're in the investigatory stage at this point. I understand. Okay, one concern I have, I'm going to ask a question. It doesn't seem to have been addressed adequately or at all, I should say. We also have a section nine for special exceptions. It's general conditions. And one in particular, 9.2.1, states that the location, type, character, and size of the use of any building or other structure in connection therewith shall be in harmony with and conform to the appropriate and orderly development and use of adjacent property or impair the value thereof impair the value thereof. Do you have a, a uh, credible argument that having this facility here will not impair 
the property values of its neighbors, particularly the residential, but also the commercial components? That's a question I would like to answer, that it would not impair. I don't expect the answer tonight, but at some point I would like to have it. You will. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, I got one more question, Mr. Otherwise, Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Has uh, any of these facilities that you you put in neighborhoods, has any insurance ever been canceled on any existing homes? I didn't check with my insurance department, sir. I'm not that I'm, 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 we're going to do some checking too, but I'm not that I'm aware of. But I, I, that but is you, one of the you questions. You have there. quite a few facilities, so yep. could you check and see what you find out, and I'll check and see what we can find out. If any people have been dropped, or the insurance doubled, <coughs> or because it came, it came a hazard. And I prefer that from and understand that will be one of the one of the things we'll be looking into and getting Because that seems like a pretty big, uh, and the value of the homes have been going down. To that, to that point, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think what would be good in these locations that were listed to see grand list records for those towns before these were built and after they were built to give us some analysis. I'd like to see the raw data, but I, along with any analysis that they might do. Uh, but that would, I think, give that would probably answer that question as to what what happened to, to the values of surrounding property in similar facilities, either in Connecticut or elsewhere. Right, I think the yeah, original, all over the place. Yeah, Bridgeport, Weathers, Weathersfield, Albany, Westboro. Um, those, I think those are the locations that he mentioned, that they mentioned. And it would be good to get, if they could, could get Thank it from, yeah, from their, from their assessor, from the assessors of those towns, what the record might be. Is that a possibility? Uh, I can look into it. I would caution the commission that looking at real estate prices, you know, if you took a look from 2007 and no facility built versus to 2010, in some places in this country there was a decline of 50% and no facility was built. And then since then, prices of houses have gone up. So I, I can look back and, again, we can discuss about how we get back to you. I understand the concern. That would seem to be an analysis that would be extremely complicated uh, to understand. The number one concern of most of the people here that were here tonight losing their insurance. I uh, understand that. Case. So I think to look at that regarding the house values is probably kind of hard, but the insurance, has yes, people's insurance been canceled, dropped, or, or raised? Absolutely. That should be easy. Yep. Understand that we will get back here on that. Any other questions from the commissioners? If not, I would entertain a motion to continue this public hearing to Jules. I'm sorry. So moved. So there's a motion to continue the public hearing to July 7th at 7 o'clock in the green room. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Staunton seconded. All in, uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, this hearing has been continued to July 7th. Gentlemen, I am going to allow a few minutes for the, the room to clear and we'll take up on our last question. Thank you very much for, for being so courteous. Now you can make up the boring stuff, the...